freedom, man. That's what it's all about. You've got to groove on freedom, like the good book says. Welcome. You are listening to What on Earth is Happening. This show will discuss the topics of human consciousness, mind control, natural law, the occult, and all issues that affect the freedom of the people of Earth. What on Earth is Happening will endeavor to shine light upon the darkness of our world and to offer empowering solutions to the problems we face as humanity approaches its critical moment of choice. And now, here is your host, Mark Passio. Welcome one and all, you're watching What on Earth is Happening. I'm your host, Mark Passio. My website, whatonearthishappening.com. Ladies and gentlemen, government is slavery. And here on What on Earth is Happening, we are ending slavery one mind at a time. Welcome to the show, everyone. Glad that you're tuning in. Today is Sunday, July 28th, 2019. This is episode 217 of What on Earth is Happening. This show is live every Sunday from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 noon to 3 p.m. Pacific Time. We have a great show lined up for you here today. We're going to be getting into some deep occult working here. I'm going to be discussing the major arcana of the tarot as a revelation and an indicator of both personal progress in consciousness and spirituality and societal progress in consciousness and spirituality. The tarot can actually be used as a gauge, an indicator of sorts in this respect. And a lot of people don't even know or understand that the tarot is a tool for just such a thing. So this is going to be the main topic of discussion today. Uh, Some of it will be review, some of it will be somewhat new. Um, As always, what on earth is happening is a tapestry, ladies and gentlemen. This is something I've been repeating on the past several shows and will continue to repeat. Uh, No one episode stands on its own. This show has to be um, viewed, listened to, and viewed in relation to all other previous shows. So... Episode number 217 has 216 prerequisite episodes. So if you're a new listener, if you're a new viewer, you don't want to just start here. You want to go back to number one of the podcast series and watch them, listen to them and watch them in order at your own pace. In that way, the greatest uh, tapestry of connections will emerge in your understanding And you will not be confused with newest material that depends on older material. So just keep that in mind. What on earth is happening is and always has been a tapestry of information that is meant to be taken in as a whole. The newer episodes stand upon and are built upon older episodes. Everyone who is listening should be aware of that. That being said, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements to get into before we jump into the main body of material for today. So uh, let's go over to the laptop. Okay, I will be speaking at the inaugural Anarchadelphia Conference. Anarchadelphia 2019 will be taking place September 13th, 14th, and 15th, 2019, right here in Philadelphia. Um, If you buy your tickets at anarchadelphia.com with promo code PASIO, you will get 5% off of your ticket sale 
your ticket price and 5% of the ticket will be donated directly to What on Earth is Happening. So uh, you can get more information about this great conference and all the tremendous speakers that are going to be taking part in it at anarchadelphia.com. I will also be giving a workshop at Anarchadelphia the day following the conference. This will be taking place Monday, September 16th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. It's an all-day workshop. Uh, my main lecture at the conference will be taking place on Saturday, September 14th. I'll be the final speaker on Saturday evening. And my talk is entitled, The Sacred Gift of Anger. The Sacred Gift of Anger will be my main presentation. My workshop on Monday will be called Teaching Natural Law with Mark Passio. It will be an all-day workshop on how to bring the message of natural law to other people and uh, going over a lot of the skill sets that are going to be required to do that if you wish to actually become a teacher of the material that I've been talking about here on What on Earth is Happening since day one. So September 16th, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. at Poppy's Italian Restaurant at 3120 South 20th Street in Philadelphia. The tickets for the workshop are $120 and they could be purchased at anarchadelphia.com in the workshop section. We will also be screening a rough draft of my premiere documentary, the, the first ever documentary that What on Earth is Happening has ever put out. Uh, this will also be taking place Saturday, September 14th, right after my main presentation of The Sacred Gift of Anger. We'll be screening my premiere documentary entitled Mark Passio and the Science of Natural Law. And this will be a rough cut. I don't believe that we'll have the finished final cut that's going to go out um, to the public, but the attendees of Anarchadelphia 2019 will be able to watch uh, a premiere of the rough draft of Mark Passio and the Science of Natural Law documentary. So uh, that's uh, Anarchadelphia 2019. Now, um, I did tell people that the t-shirts, the new t-shirts would be in this week. That did not occur. Uh, there was um, a shortage of a certain color and I had to uh, go with a slightly different variation of one of the colors of the t-shirts that I was going to print uh, for this next batch of uh, What on Earth is Happening t-shirts in the donation gifts area of the website. That held up the order a little bit. It is definitely going to be ready at the beginning of this week, I've been told by the uh, company that's pressing the shirts. So uh, all the new shirts will be ready to go at some point this week, and they'll be at gifts.whatonearthishappening.com, the donation gifts area of my website. Also, Anarchy and the Occult Part 2 um, will be available on the uh, What on Earth is Happening donation gifts area as well later this week. I was trying to get it up uh, by the end of this week, but what happened was I took a couple of days uh, vacation for myself after the uh, last episode and I went down to the Jersey Shore to visit with family with a few friends and uh, got to unwind a little bit. That's why the podcast didn't go up until Wednesday uh, in the afternoon. So, um, you know, I just took a little bit to relax and unwind and um, just, uh, you know, get some sun and uh, hit the uh, ocean at the Jersey Shore. So, that is why I didn't get a chance to really work on the artwork for um, the cover of Anarchy and the Occult and the disc and the, and the flash drive. So I'll be doing that early this week, going back to my normal work schedule. And um, I will be getting that in the donation gifts area as well in the form of a flash drive and a DVD uh, later uh, this week coming up. So just keep an eye out for those, for those items. Uh, I think that's all the housekeeping announcements that I have for this week. So we can uh, jump back over to the computer and uh, let's jump into our topic material for today. Again, today's show is episode 217 and it is entitled The Tarot's Major Arcana, A Revelation of Personal and Societal Progress. And we are talking about personal and societal progress in consciousness in spirituality, in our manifestation of either slavery or freedom, 
depending on which direction we are going in consciousness and in spirituality, in true spirituality. So um, this is going to be the main topic of discussion, and I just want to say that this will take as long as it takes. We may or may not get to calls. It could take, uh, you know, an hour and a half to two hours to go through this. It could take two whole shows to go through this topic uh, and the material that's contained in it. So there is no time limit set on this. We will cover it until I feel it's been covered to my satisfaction. And then we will take your calls on this topic. So you can call in through Discord, as always. I don't know if I will be getting the calls today. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see how the uh, main you know, material goes for today. So let's jump in to this topic. And this is a huge topic. The major arcana of the tarot. I call this the self and the universe revealed in symbol. This is what we have to understand that the tarot really is, especially the major arcana of the tarot. Not to, you know, place even less emphasis on the minor arcana, but um, that gets into the finer gradations of information regarding consciousness and self. The major arcana hits us with the very heavyweight material that we really definitively really need to understand, to understand what's going on within us and in the world around us. And the tarot is greatly misunderstood. Uh, it's, a, it's a science and it's an art that is so powerful when properly decoded and understood for the powerful symbolism that it contains that I can't understate it enough that people do not use the tarot properly, do not read it properly, do not uh, decode it properly, and do not understand the symbolism contained therein the way that it was really intended to be understood. And this is typical of the modern world where knowledge is fallen, where, you know, people do not go into the same depth that they did in the past uh, regarding knowledge. They take it lightly and they don't really deeply understand what it's conveying. And I'm, th this series here is an effort to try to correct that because a lot of people think that tarot is like something to use for fortune telling and divination. And while the tarot could be used for that purpose, it is infinitely more than that, as we will see in today's episode. Now, today's episode is somewhat of a, of a review. I'll be reviewing a lot of material that I've covered in presentations in the past. And some of it is new regarding how we really should be seeing the tarot, Major Arcana in particular, as a revelatory tool. This is, I've used the term revelation and the self and the universe revealed. Because that's what this is. This is occulted knowledge that has to be decoded in order to reveal what it's really saying deeply underneath at a hidden level. And that takes work to decode it. That takes time. You know, I didn't understand this when I just started looking at tarot symbolism, like buying a couple of decks down at the local occult shop, you know, on South Street here in South Philadelphia. <clears throat> I picked up the first tarot decks that I ever read probably when I was, an, you know, early teen years, like 13 years old, 14 years old maybe. And I had no idea what I was really looking at. And this is most people's experience of the tarot when they first encounter it. They see these odd and strange images depicted on cards and they, you know, think it like loosely relates to some imagery of the regular playing card deck that has come down to us in the modern world, which is actually you know, derived from the tarot. And uh, the, people don't really know what they're looking at. They don't know how to read this book. This is a book. The tarot is a book. It's been referred to as the book of truth. It's been referred to as the book of the universe. It's been referred to as the book of natural law, the book of the goddess, many other things. So we have to understand that the tarot is speaking a language to us that we have to decode in order to understand what it's really saying. You know, it's not just 78 cards in a, in a playing deck, okay? That's a gross undersimplification and misunderstanding of it. Uh, this is an entire book of life, is what it really is. There's nothing that is of any major importance or significance in the universe that's not contained in the tarot. That's how much information is within it, actually. And there, people will, you know, th find that hard to believe and say, oh, no, it can't be so. But when you really start to dive into it at a deep level and de-occult the secrets contained in the tarot, you'll realize that 
I am exactly telling you the truth about what it contains. So let's jump in and take a look at what this is all about. The tarot is a book of occult knowledge. It contains deeply occulted knowledge. So when people, look, we, we've talked about the occult ad infinitum here on what, are, what on earth is happening. And there's still people, I still get emails of people who say, you shouldn't be dabbling in that stuff. That's evil. That's bad. That's not meant for us. And that this shows me that people just have zero idea of what occultism really is. They don't know what the occult is. They don't know what it means. They don't know how powerful the information of the world of the occult and it, the knowledge that it contains is. And they don't understand why we need to know it most importantly. And that's what I hope to really bring to people with this tarot series. Okay. Um, occultism is a body of science. That's where we get the word uh, to know from. Knowledge comes from the Latin verb schiere. It's where the word science comes from. Schiere is spelled S-C-I-E-R-E. -E. It's a verb. And the verb translated into English, the Latin verb schiere, means to know or to understand. That is where the word science comes from. So right off the bat, I'm telling people that occultism, in the genuine sense of the term, is not a belief system or a religion. And people will insist that it is. They'll insist this with their dying breath, that occultism is some quaint religion. It has absolutely nothing to do with religion or belief, ladies and gentlemen. Occultism comprises a science about how we work and about how the world around us works. And that is not a belief system. We can come to know that. We can come to know how we work and how the universe works through observation and study and testing and experimenting and hypothesizing and then testing our, uh, you know, projected uh, hypotheses and then getting actual results in the world and comparing them against our models and then refining them. That's called the scientific methodology. There is no belief required in any of this. You know, I've said before religion, which is a false belief system of any kind that prevents our progress in consciousness is the one and only problem in the world, no matter what form religion comes to us in, whether it comes to us in the form of the cultural religions or whether it comes to us in the form of the belief in authority, the belief in the legitimacy of government, the belief in the monetary system, etc. You can go on and on with modern religions. Science can become a religion if there's too much faith in it and not enough knowledge actively applied. When we just believe what scientists tell us and we don't do the work ourselves to verify the information that they're bringing forward and putting on the table, then it can become the religion called scientism. You know, um, the modern medical system can be a religion. You know, people believe in that with religious fervor. And of course, government politics is a religion. It's one of the biggest religions in the world, the belief in authority and government. So occultism is a body of science, not belief, not religion. That's first and foremost to clear up. And the tarot is contained within this body of knowledge called occultism. It's one of what people have called the four major occult sciences. And that is Kabbalah, which we're going to be talking about, um, uh, tarot, uh, numerology and astrology. Okay. These are occult sciences when properly decoded. So it's a body. Occultism itself is a body of science, which is not widely known to the general population. That means that it's esoteric information. It's not exoteric. Exoteric means that the general population gets it. It's for them. They understand it. You know, the average everyday man and woman look into it and kind of understand it. That's exoteric. Esoteric means it's reserved for people who study it very deeply for the initiate who's going to go much deeper on this path into this occulted knowledge. So occultism, you could call an, uh, the esoteric sciences. They're reserved for the people who are going to go way deep into the inner core of these traditions to go much further in their understanding and expand their worldview. 
And occultism consists of hidden knowledge about the workings of the human psyche and the laws of nature. In other words, both when we're talking about the laws of nature here, we're talking about the, the seen laws, the physical laws that govern matter, okay, that govern physical matter. So this would be like physics, electromagnetism, etc. You know, all the laws of thermodynamics, you know, all the laws of, uh, you know, um, dynamics in physics, okay, the Newtonian laws, etc. And then down into even quantum mechanics, we're talking about things that govern the the seen matter in our reality, the, in, in the uh, electromagnetic spectrum that we are, are, we exist in in the 3D sense. But occultism is also the study of the unseen laws of nature. So these are the hidden spiritual laws that govern the consequence of our free will based behavioral choices. So when we choose to behave a, a certain way, natural law goes into effect that is unseen in the physical domain and it gives us the consequence of the behaviors that we choose, but those come through into and are manifested in the physical domain. So you could even say that the unseen laws have physical consequences and physical reper repercussions in the very real seen physical domain. So these are all physical laws at some level of existence. So now occultism has two major bodies of knowledge and these are encapsulated and symbolized in the tarot's major arcana. Okay, so you have the minor arcana, right? Now that's that's the, the suit decks, the suit um, uh, cards of the tarot. Okay, so you have cups, uh, wands, swords and coins okay and they've been called various slightly different variations of those names and these come down to us in the playing deck you know as diamonds clubs hearts and spades okay it's 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 just a different variation of them in the modern playing deck Th that's called the minor arcana but i'm going to depict the first part of the major arcana as the inner, this inner world or microcosmic world. When we, when I show you the layout of the first 11 cards of the major arcana of the tarot on what is known as the microcosmic tree of life of the Kabbalah. Okay. Then we're going to lay out the second 11 cards of the major arcana of the tarot cards, uh, 11 through 21 in the layout known as the macrocosmic tree of life of the Kabbalah. So we're going to get into Kabbalah a little bit in this episode because I'm going to explain to people how tarot and Kabbalah are inseparable. They cannot be studied in isolation. To study one is actually to study the other. And if you try to break apart those studies, you're going to end up with an incomplete picture and an incomplete understanding, not only of the sim symbology, but of the correspondences contained in the tarot deck. Okay. So first, before I even get to Kabbalah, understand that tarot and Kabbalah are inseparable occult sciences and have to be studied together in conjunction with each other. If they're going to be properly understood, uh, as they are intended, uh, the, uh, for the knowledge that they are actually intended to convey. So the first body of occult knowledge is the knowledge of self. It is the knowledge of how the human psyche actually works and operates. So this is what the dark occultists of our world have. The sorcerers, the mind controllers, the social engineers, whatever name you want to refer to them as. Okay. You could call them the dark occult as I do. If you're going to use this horrible, uh, correspondent term, the Illuminati, please call them the dark Illuminati. Just don't use the term illuminated ones because it's just a horrible reference uh, because Illuminati in Latin means those who are enlightened and the dark sorcerers of our world, the social engineer mind controllers of our world are not enlightened beings. 
okay? You want to use the term Illuminati, refer to myself and other people with the knowledge that I possess as the Illuminati, please. Don't call the uh, violent, um, mind-controlling masters of our planet the Illuminati. If you're going to say that they have knowledge and talk about the term Illuminati in that respect, call them the darkly illuminated ones, okay? Put dark in front of it, like I put dark occult in front of the occult to make people understand there's two sides of this coin, you know? All, and see, another thing is a lot of religious people, you, you don't get this, boys and girls, little boys and little girls who are only ever reaching the queen's chamber and not going all the way to the king's chamber of the great pyramid inside the mind and inside the human heart, okay? You know, that the, the whole pyramid is a reference for occulted knowledge. The pit, the ascending passageway, the, the queen's chamber and the king's chamber. It's all about the process leading to enlightenment. And, you, you know, it's not to mean that the sacred feminine is any less important than the sacred masculine. Okay, it's just terms that were given to the uh, chambers inside the Great Pyramid as an allegory. You stop at the Queen's Chamber, you stop at just that, that middle chamber, you're not getting to the top. You're not getting to that King's Chamber that leads out to the stars, okay, where the shafts actually lead out into space and present a much further, deeper understanding of our reality. If you stop at the Queen's Chamber, you have stopped that religious belief but you have not gone to occult knowledge. And this is what too many religious people do. So there's religious people who listen to this broadcast and I'm trying to explain to them since day one, you've stopped short and you've set up your tent halfway up the, the mountaintop and you're not reaching the mountaintop, okay? Religion is holding you back from the summit. It's holding you back from the topmost understanding, the apex of understanding of how it all works. And a lot of religious people want to say, oh, we know that the people who are running the show on this planet, the people who are really the social engineers of this reality are Satanists. They're satanic. They're dark occultists. A lot of the religious people get that. But then they want to say, oh, my religion is untainted. You know, it hasn't been affected by these social engineers. It hasn't been infiltrated. Everyone else's has except mine. You're full of yourself is what it really boils down to. And they want to say, don't look into that occult stuff. That's for them. No, this is what they have hidden from us to make sure that we will never be at their level of knowledge and understanding of both ourselves and the deep inner workings of our mind and the world around us and how nature really works and how the natural laws really work to bring us the manifestation of our behavior. They don't want us knowing anything about that, these dark occultists. They have this knowledge. What are they doing with it? They're wielding it against us as a weapon. Because if you know everything there is to know about how someone's mind works, and you know everything there is to know about how the laws of nature work, and your prey knows nothing of those forces and factors at work in their reality, imagine how much they are at your mercy. So to all the religious folk out there who are telling people, don't look into this, do you know what you're telling people to do? You're telling people, don't have the knowledge that your masters wield over you to manipulate you. You don't need that. That's what you sound like. That's the baby that you sound like. That's the child, the infant child you sound like. And it's not coming from a place of good innocence. It's coming from a place of total naivete. Total naivete. And someone who came out of this world who's trying to give you their playbook of what they understand, you still don't want to listen to it from them because you think you know better. And you don't know any better. You're in a place of negative knowledge. Not only don't you know what the occult is, you have a false belief of what you think it is. And your belief is completely wrong. It's completely erroneous. And by refusing to study this information, you are ensuring that your masters maintain a power advantage over you because you remain in ignorance and they remain in a position of tremendous knowledge 
And that knowledge differential is always going to be able to be converted to a power differential over you and over all the other people who remain ignorant of what I've been attempting to show people here since day one on what on earth is happening. So, the minor arcana is the microcosmic world, the knowledge of the microcosmic world or the inner world of the self. It is knowledge of the human psyche and how it operates. This has been traditionally depicted as the first card of the major arcana or the zero card known as the fool. This card was originally the soul card of the tarot. Now, when I eventually get to making a tarot deck, look, I've been talking about writing a book. I've been talking about making a documentary. I've been talking about many presentations. You got to understand how slow the work progresses here because I have to, you know, do a lot of things during the week that I'm not freed up to do because while I have a minimum staff, a lot of things are still left in my hands and I can't just create the content that I want to create. Unfortunately, I'm trying to work to fill positions and get the help that I need so I can really just create new content. But, you know, one of the goals is to make a tarot deck. I want to make a what on earth is happening tarot deck. Okay. And some different artists have volunteered to help contribute to that, that effort. But in all honesty, I, I think I'm going to take my assistant Leah's uh, recommendation and, or I'm, I'm sorry, not recommendation, but offer uh, to, uh, have her do the art. I've seen some of her art. It's very good. And I think she has the skill set to design a tarot deck. So I'm probably going to take her up on the offer to just sit and work with me on making at least the 22 cards of the major arcana and maybe make just some basic suit cards uh, with, um, you know, the numbers of the deck uh, for the minor arcana. If she wants to go all the way out and do the sev all 78 as different cards like are done in, uh, you know, the Rider weight deck and other decks like that. If we have, you know, a very extended amount of time to do that uh, and that will is there, maybe we'll do all 78. Some cards you see just do stylized numbered interpretations of the suit cards. Uh, but um, we're, we'll definitely at least do all 22 cards of the major arcana. So I think I'm going to take her up on her offer and at some point, maybe in the next hopefully year or two, get to work on making a what on earth is happening tarot deck, which will probably take a couple of years to complete at least. But that's a project that's definitely uh, in the works. And, you know, I, I'm thinking a lot about what I would do. And I would, of course, call this card the soul. You know, what I my, my idea of a tarot deck for, for what I would want to put out would be to call the cards what they are. Forget this, you know, allegorical interpretation that, that makes people read all deep into it. Now, I'm not saying that's not valuable, right? To, to do that work helps you to use your mind to decode. But, but maybe if we had a deck that really called the cards what they are, then people can really see the correspondences readily. Okay. So this would be like de-occulting the tarot for the everyday man and woman. That's the idea of my deck. The, the what on earth is happening deck. Eventually we will have, we will make it. Okay. You know, so that's the minor arcana and just think about it. That's wh exactly what it's telling you. It's knowledge of our soul. It's knowledge of what we need to be working upon, upon building. We are here to be builders of ourselves, builders of our souls. Okay. That's the minor arcana or the inner world of knowledge, knowledge about who we really are. And we're going to be breaking that down in the microcosmic tree of life later today. Now the major arcana holds the opposite knowledge or it holds a different form of occult knowledge, I should say. And this is the macrocosmic knowledge, knowledge of the macrocosmic world, knowledge of how matter works, of how heavenly bodies move. Okay. About how all the laws of physics work, you know, the laws that underlie that electromagnetism, gravity, etc. So this is knowledge of the natural world, but it's also knowledge of natural law. Okay. It's not just knowledge of the physical world. It's knowledge of the greater laws of creation in the form of the moral spiritual laws, the laws of karma, the laws of cause and effect when it comes to behavior. 
okay? So those, that behavioral science is contained in the major arcana of the tarot as well, in the second half of it, mostly, okay? So, occult knowledge comprises all of the laws of nature. Its study is to study all of the laws of nature, both the seen laws that govern the physical domain and the unseen laws that govern the spiritual domain. And these are ultimately really one and the same. There's really no separation between the physical and spiritual. We have to see them as unified. We have to see them as one holistic body. Too many people separate those things and that's what leads to the dichotomies that are found in religion and religious belief systems. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. In the modern world, tarot has in inherited a terrible reputation as being used primarily and al almost uh, exclusively for fortune telling. And this is the problem of charlatans who don't really know what the tarot truly is, but have, you know, gone into this tradition of masking it as a fortune telling tool, a divinatory tool. Divination is about, you know, predicting the future. Uh, with, um, you know, throwing or casting some type of a lot uh, down on a table or on the ground and in the form of many different things, bones, runes, cards, etc. Okay? And what we have to understand is that the tarot is infinitely more than trying to uh, conduct divination and do fortune telling. So, the tarot you, tradition uses rich, multifaceted symbolism portrayed upon a deck of 78 cards to convey truths regarding the aspects of our own being and the laws of the cosmos, as we just saw in the previous slide. The tarot deck consists of two components, the major arcana and the minor arcana. The major arcana consists of 22 cards, 11 of which deal with aspects of the human psyche, that's cards 0 through 10 in the major arcana, the first 11 cards, and then 11 of which deal with aspects of natural law, the greater laws of the cosmos. That is cards 11 through 21. The minor arcana consists of 56 cards divided into four suits, wands, cups, swords, and coins each consisting of 14 cards in each suit. So in within each suit, you have ace through 10 numbered cards, or one through 10, and then you have four court cards for each suit. And those are, you have um, a knight, a queen, king, and um, uh, usually a page, okay? So let's continue with this slide. Sadly, however, in modern times, the tarot is looked upon by many as being nothing more than a prop in the repertoire of fortune tellers. While the system of cards could be used as an intuitive divinatory aid, this is considered by serious students of tarot to be an ancillary usage of the deck at best meaning it's a secondary usage and it is not what the deck is primarily supposed to be used for. The deck is supposed to be used to probe into a deeper understanding of occult wisdom, not to just be used for fortune telling. Okay, While it can be used for that, that's one of the aspects you can use it for, that's not its main aspect, that's an ancillary usage. Okay. The tarot was traditionally seen in its pure esoteric form as a means of conveying deep truths through covert means, through covert symbolism, rich covert symbolism, or occult symbolism, without needing to write down or even speak the message aloud. No words needed on paper to print on books. The message is contained in the symbols themselves, in the pictorial elements of the cards. If a picture speaks a thousand words, and it does, a tarot deck, when deeply understood, 
speaks countless millions. Okay? This is a book, as I've said. So it's not just a deck of cards. It's an understanding of everything that is very important for us to understand. There's really nothing that's not contained in the knowledge of the tarot. That's why it's been referred to as the book of life. So let's briefly look at the four uh, suits of the minor arcana of the tarot. These are the suit cards that comprise the minor arcana. And we won't be breaking these uh, suits down in detail today. At some point I will do an expose and go very in depth on all of the minor arcana of the tarot. That might be a coming What on Earth is Happening presentation uh, show, you know, on, on the show here. Uh, and uh, I may might do a couple. Maybe I'll take um, one show to do each um, suit and break down every single card within the minor arcana over a period of four shows. We'll do a show on coins, one on swords, one on cups, and one on wands. I think that would be a great uh, breakdown for uh, four future What on Earth is Happening episodes to really go in depth of the minor arcana, which is something I have not done on What on Earth is Happening as of yet. Maybe I'll do um, even the ancillary usage once we cover the main usage of the tarot, once we cover the main deep occult importance of it, which is the most important thing to understand. Maybe I'll do a whole show where I do some tarot readings and do some divinatory work with the deck. I think that would be very interesting to do right here on what on earth is happening. So um, what you have to understand about the four decks of the minor arcana, the four uh, suits of the minor arcana, I should say, is they represent different qualities of the self as well. So the coins suit are the material plane or earth. So this would correlate to the four elements. These, these suits correlate to the four elements of earth, air, water, and fire that is often, that are often discussed in the occult tradition of alchemy. But what do they really mean? What do the elements of earth, air, water, and fire really mean? You know, they themselves are symbolic allegories. So earth has always been traditionally used to represent the material plane. Resources, inherent qualities, things that we utilize in the physical world that are needed, that we have to put into play to use to accomplish what we want to do, to accomplish the great work of ending human slavery. Resources are needed and are important. And they should not be shunned, okay? It's when we place too much important on, importance on resources that we then get greed and materialism. You know, but we need resources to do the work. You know, we have to use our physical bodies to do the work. So the earth element is not just inferior. It's the lowest of the four in terms of how much they really uh, ascend into a higher vibratory form, you know, starting at earth and ending up at fire, okay? And we'll look at that when we look at these suits. But we have to understand that all of them are necessary and need to be put together and none should be seen as inferior or superior. So that's coins, okay? Some decks call it pentacles, and some decks refer to this as discs. So you will hear it called coins, pentacles, and discs. In the Rider uh, series of tarot decks and the various uh, different interpretations and variations of the Rider deck, like the Rider weight, the universal weight, which is what we'll be mostly using today, which is my favorite of the Rider variations, <clears throat> I like many decks. What well, we could talk about, you know, different decks at some point, like the Thoth deck, the um, the Universal Weight, um, the Egyptian deck. Um, there's a Masonic deck. Um, there are um, d variations of the Golden Dawn deck, the Magical Golden Dawn, etc. You know, Crowley's Thoth deck. 
So, you know, we can go into maybe a breakdown of different decks at some point. I could show you the decks that I actually physically own. I think that would be a nice thing to do on a future show. So, um, you know, uh, the deck I'll be using in the uh, visual representations of the cards today are the Universal Weight deck. Okay, and I'll, I'll post that deck with this episode. I'll post all 78 cards, depictions of them in JPEG form um, with the episode in the related uh, document section of the podcast. So going back to the breakdown of these different suits, we see that swords then um, is the air aspect of the four elements. And this is the intellect or the mental plane represented by swords. Most decks simply refer to this as swords. I haven't really seen too many different uh, variations on uh, other names. Um, again, the coins uh, deck would um, <clears throat> would correlate to um, diamonds on the traditional playing card deck. The swords deck would correlate to <coughs> spades. Okay? So... Um, this is the usage of our mind and our intellect. It is our ability to perceive and break things down and analyze. Hence, you have the swords, which are a cutting quality. We often refer to it, he has a cutting intellect. He has a cutting mind, okay? So this is why swords were chosen for this. As a blade cuts, the mind cuts and breaks things down and separates and analyzes, okay? So, uh, that's the swords, uh, suit of the deck. Then we have cups, which represents our emotional qualities. And in the alchemical tradition, uh, this was symbolized as the element of water, the flow that is within us. Okay. The emotional plane. Okay. Always depicted as the sacred feminine aspect of the cup. Okay. Or the chalice. And we're using the ace of each one of these decks to depict uh, the minor arcana suits, okay? So here you see the dove and the communion wafer, okay? Symbols of the sacred feminine, the Holy Spirit in the, uh, you know, Christian tradition. And the chalice, okay? Holding the water, which is then converted into wine in that tradition. A lot of Christian symbolism here in the uh, universal weight deck. But this is the Holy Grail, Okay? The emotional aspect has to be developed so that it gives birth to right action, which is what wands represents. So, you know, it's been called ch cups. Some will refer to it as chalices. There, there's, you know, decks that call this different things. This uh, cups correlates to the heart, um, hearts um, aspect of the regular playing deck, um, the suit of the regular playing deck. And of course, that's emotions, heart. Okay. Uh, you could s very clearly see the correlations in the regular playing deck, okay? So, wands represents action, okay? Represented by wands or clubs, okay? Clubs in the traditional playing deck. This is the plane of will, okay? And when you look into Kabbalah, you'll see all of these worlds. The four worlds of the Kabbalah are this aspect of uh, the tarot, each one representing one of the suits, Okay, one of the alchemical elements. Uh, we've broken that down before. I'm not going to get in, be getting into the worlds of the Kabbalah today, but we will be looking at the Tree of Life extensively. Okay, so uh, this is called different things, you know, wands, clubs, etc. in different decks. But we'll be referring to it as wands here. So those are the minor arcana of the tarot, the four suits of the minor arcana. The word tarot itself comes from the goddess tradition in the ancient world. Um, it actually comes from the name Tara. Tara, uh, a woman's name in the modern world, was the oldest name of the original, in the original goddess tradition which came out of the Far East and the Indus Valley tradition. So the goddess is named after our planet because our planet's name has traditionally been called Terra. Okay, in, in the ancient Latin, it was referred to as Terra. Terra means Earth. Okay, 
So the soil, the earth, the planet itself, Mother Nature, Terra, Terra. Again, you're going to see if you really study etymological roots of things and you study ancient word origins, you're, you're going to largely see that the vowels that separate the consonants don't matter. It's T-R, okay? Just like as we talked about the dark god or the black sun in the dark occult is B-L, bell, bale, bill, bull, okay? It, the, the, the vowel sound is largely interchangeable. Well, it's the same here when it comes to the earth and the goddess, okay? It's T-R, okay? So you'll see different variations of it as you study the goddess tradition. You'll see that as this tradition moved from east to west through the Indus Valley into the mi middle, what we now call the Middle East and then into the Levant area and then eventually through all of Europe, um, it was um, originally Tara, then it became in, in Egypt, uh, well, in, actually in the Indus Valley, Ta'urth, and then in Egypt, Ta'urt, and you had uh, other variations, Ta'ruth, okay, and then we get the name Ruth from that, okay, and we also get the name, the word truth from that, when you say it quickly, Ta'ruth, Ta'ruth. It's, again, another variant of the TR, and in this case, TRT. We're just taking the first letter and then transposing it to the end. And that's really what we have in the word tarot, T-A-R-O-T. The vowels are, can largely be lost or are interchangeable, okay? It is a name for the goddess, Tarut, okay? One of the names in ancient Egyptian. So... What does this actually really, you know, how is it really symbolized, the name? How, T-A-R-O-T, -T why is this? First of all, it's actually in the tarot deck. In most decks, the Wheel of Fortune will actually have the four uh, letters that comprise the word tarot, T-A-R and O, okay? And then you come back to the T full circle, okay? And almost invariably, this is in the card known as the Wheel of Fortune, or 10, which as we will see represents the bottom of the microcosmic tree of life, or the Malkuth position of the microcosmic tree of life in Kabbalah. And if we just look at the symbolism on this card briefly, um, actually, um, Barb was asking me about this card uh, when I met up with her earlier this week. Uh, to break down some of the symbolism, and it's very interesting that this would be my topic for the uh, show this week, and this card plays a major importance in it. So um, I'll just briefly break down some of the symbolism on this card. The Wheel of Fortune is the card that is really telling us why it is so important to study the tarot, okay? This is what, the, this card represents us staying where we're at largely, Okay, personally, mostly, all right? It, 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 it correlates to the world staying where it's at because if the individual members of a society stay where they're at in consciousness, in base, low consciousness, the whole society will stay in slavery and judgment, which we will see. So what we have to understand here is that it has the ancient name in Hebrew of God on the card. That's called the Tetragrammaton, or the four-letter name for God in ancient Hebrew. yod Hey vav Hey, And this would be uh, read from, obviously, right to left, counterclockwise around the tarot deck. Okay? So you have the Yod in the upper right, and then you're going to go to the upper left for the first Hey, and then to the bottom left for the Vav, I'll actually outline this with my mouse if I can bring it onto the screen here. Oh, I'm sorry, I forwarded it accidentally. Let me see if I can make the mouse appear. I'm having a, I think my mouse may have, um, there, there it is, okay. All right, sorry about that. So this is the uh, Yod character on the wheel, okay. And then this is the first Hey, and then this is Vav, and this is Hey. So if we transliterate these into English, 
This would be a Y in English. This would be H. This would be V. And this would be another H. So YHVH gives us the name Yahweh if we transliterate it. Okay. And that is the ancient name of God in the Hebrew tradition. Okay. So that's incorporated into here. You'll see um, Christian symbolism come forth in the tarot. You'll see Hebrew symbolism. You might even see some Islamic symbolism. You'll definitely see Egyptian symbolism all over the tarot deck because the tarot ultimately comes out of the um, Egyptian world, the ancient Egyptian world, and predates it. Okay? So uh, the tarot name is then given in the clockwise direction, T, A, R, and O. Now, these are both placed at um, the areas of the wheel of the season that represent the breakdown of the season into the four seasons, the solstices and the equinoxes. So you, you would have the four seasons broken down by the regular cross, and then you would have the fixed signs of the zodiac representing both the great cross of the galaxy and representing the midpoints of each season. Okay, so you have the lesser cross where the T-A-R and O are at, and you have the great cross, okay, at uh, the, the um, uh, midpoints of the seasons, which we talked about as where the Sabbaths, the major four Sabbaths are, okay? So this is called in the Christian tradition, the cross of St. George and the cross of St. Andrew, okay? <clears throat> and you have the symbolism of the four Gospels, okay, and the four fixed signs of the zodiac in the corners. These are the archangels in the Christian tradition as well. Okay, so the archangels are Michael, or if we're pronouncing it the ancient way, Mik Mikael, right? Then Raphael, Gabriel, and Uriel. Those are the four angels of the corners. Okay, but these represent the midpoints of the seasons and the great galactic cross, the great uh, a solar system and galactic cross that actually positions, gives us the positioning for our star in, the, in our uh, galaxy. Okay, so uh, in the Christian tradition, this is the gospel authors of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We could look at this as the quadrivium, okay? Um, and then we could also look at it as uh, the lion, the man, the bull, and the eagle, okay? So, you know, many different variations. So uh, just briefly, the, um, the lion, of course, is Leo down here. This would represent Leo, the, the, the fixed fire sign. So this gives us also the four um, minor arcana decks and their uh, elemental associations out of alchemy, earth, air, water, and fire. So the fire sign is Leo. The, the lion, right? So the lion, the man, is the angel, the man, okay? The uh, Aquarius sign, that's actually an air sign, okay? So that would be uh, the air sign. And so the lion would represent wands or fire or action. That's Leo, okay? Here we have the man slash angel, okay? This would be Aquarius, on the zodi zodiacal wheel, okay, because that's what we're really talking about here. That's why the tarot is a wheel. We're talking about the zodiacal wheel here. It's not just the wheel of fortune in our lives. It's the great wheel, the great cycle of the great year as well, okay, and the procession of the equinoxes. All of it's contained there, the, the greater and the lesser, okay? So the... Um, this is Aquarius, which is an air sign, and that would be the intellect. Okay, then the bull. This is Taurus. Okay, so this is the earth sign, and that is, that's earth, that's the resources. Okay, that is the, um, the suit of coins or pentacles. And then the eagle, that represents Scorpio. This is a water sign, and that would be the emotional 
aspects, and this would be cups on the tarot deck. And of course, again, they are the four angels, the archangels, Mikael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Uriel. These are the four gospel authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we could, you know, get into the breakdown of exactly what they are, but, you know, I don't want to get that deeply into it. All right, I'm just explaining the basic symbology of the card. Of course, you have the Sphinx who represents the guardian of the gateway to knowledge and to greater understanding of ourself and the world in which we live. The Sphinx has always represented the guardianship of that knowledge in both Egypt and anywhere else that Sphinx symbolism has been used. And then we have a um, jackal holding the wheel of fortune up and then it's also cradled on the other side by a serpent. And these are forces that are at work in our lives that can either hold us back from an understanding or, you know, the Sphinx who is at the top of it. If we want to go toward uh, a greater understanding, that's a free will choice. And that's why it's called the wheel of fortune. Because if we choose wisely, we'll have good fortune. If we choose unwisely regarding our behavior and our knowledge, we're going to have bad fortune. But it's not really fortune. You know, we could call this the wheel of natural law as well. You know, it's not random chance. It's free will choice. And you know what, folks? I'm seeing a huge, huge pushback against free will in the modern world. You want to know what the darkest for? I'm going to tell you right now what the darkest forces at work in the world are. You want to think it's the dark occult and the mind controllers? No way. First of all, folks, I just want to reiterate here. Do you ever hear me really deeply attacking the dark occultists? Very, very rarely, if at all. Because I'm telling you, they're not really the ones who are holding us back. We are the ones who are holding us back. These people are just influencers. You know, we can get all into astrology maybe one day. It's my weakest occult science. I know a minor bit about it. Never really made it a gigantic study in my life. And there's a reason for that. I'm not poo-pooing it and saying there's nothing to it. Okay? Here's what I am saying. Influences are not determining factors. Let me say that again. Influences are not determining factors. That's one of the most important things. That's one of the most important revelations you're going to hear ever in what on earth is happening right there. Make a note of it. I need to make a slide with that on it. Influences are not determining factors. What does this mean? This means that energies can be influential factors, right? Forces at work in the world can be influential factors. Social engineers can be influential factors. Mind controllers, those who want to manipulate our minds are certainly influential factors. That's what these dark occultists are. That's what these dark forces at work are. They're like tides, right? We've talked about this. You want to take a boat out into the ocean and it's high tide and rough waves are coming in? Can you still get it out there? Yes, you can. But it will take a greater act of will. And that's where we're at. We're at the shore with a boat and we want to get out past the breakers and it's very rough and it's high tide and that tide is coming in strong. If we want to do it now and we need to do it now, we have to employ a tremendous effort of will. But can it be done? Yes, it can. It is not an impossibility and that is not a deterministic factor. It's not a determined set in stone thing. The same is true of astrological forces. Do the bodies, the large macrocosmic bodies of the heavens have an influence? Absolutely they do. How could something that are that large and powerful and have that much of an actual effect in space time not have an effect on consciousness? A consciousness, it's all connected. This is one living body. The solar system is one living body. And the other stars are one living body of the galaxy, which was called Nut or Nuit in the ancient Egyptian tradition. The galaxy itself, from which all the suns, the, the, the sons and daughters of the, of the galaxy, the stars, 
come from. The black void, the void of infinite night. Are the macro bodies of the heavenly spheres, are these influential factors? Of course they are. Do they determine things? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You want to get into the game where you think astrology determines things? You don't understand it. In my limited understanding, well, I may not have all the mechanics of it down pat up here because I haven't made that deep of a study of astrology in a sense that if someone thinks it, it determines everything, you know it far less than I do. I know it at an infinitely greater level because I'm trying to explain to people these are not deterministic forces. And the tarot is not here in the Wheel of Fortune card on this slide. Uh, bring the slide back up, please. Is not showing you deterministic factors on the Wheel of Fortune card. It is showing you potential influences. One is calling you forth in the greater knowledge and the others are trying to keep you where you're at. What is the real determining force? Free will. And let me go back to what I was saying about that, folks. You want to know what the greatest negative influence in the world is? One of the darkest influences in the entire world are regular human beings who themselves have become convinced that there's no such thing as free will and that everything is determined. Everything is deterministic or there were somehow robot mechanisms operating at a purely physical level that when input comes into it, we're determined to act a certain way. Nothing could be further from the truth and that is a complete bullshit lie. Free will can trump everything. That's why these cards are called the trump cards. They are showing you the forces that can trump anything except natural law. That's the only thing that cannot be trumped. Okay? The universal force that is guiding everything is natural law. You're not going to escape that. That's inescapable. That's why it's called law. It's the only thing that's really truly law. Everything else is going to be pushed forward by an act of will. Or the absence of that will, as we're going to see. Okay, so I just want to briefly touch on what the word tarot has come in the tarot tradition. This is part of the sacred feminine goddess tradition. And in the modern world, it has come forward through the Latin language to have a sort of a um, encoded meaning through the letters themselves. If we rearrange the letters in um, basic ways that, that they could be read in sequence with each other on the wheel, okay, we can come up with six Latin words. And they are as follows. The word rota, R-O-T-A in Latin. If you start with the R here and you go around clockwise, R-O-T-A. Okay? And that means wheel in Latin. And then the word taro, T-A-R-O. We're just eliminating that last, um, you know, T-A-R-O. We would start at T at the top and go clockwise. We're just eliminating the last uh Re repetitive letter, okay? And that is the tarot itself, okay? It's a phonetic equivalent, T-A-R-O, the last T is silent. Then A-R-O-T, arot. Arot is first person singular for the Latin verb arare, which means to cultivate or to grow. O-R-A-T comes from the Latin vo verb orare. It is also first person, um, I'm sorry, third person singular. Both of them are third person singular. Verb for the Latin verb orare, which means to plead or to ask to do something. To plead or to ask to do something. Okay? Then the word Torah, T-O-R-A, the phonetic equiv equivalent of the Hebrew word Torah, uh, transliterated into English as T-O-R-A-H, 
which means law in Hebrew. And then Ator, which is a phonetic equivalent, if we add the rough breathing, Ath-Hathor, okay? We're adding a rough breath equivalency, okay? So this is a phonetic equivalent of the Egyptian goddess of love, Hathor. Again, the tarot comes from the Egyptian tradition and the goddess tradition. So if we put them all together, what we, are, what we actually get as sort of a decoding of the word tarot is the wheel of tarot cultivates. It pleads the law of Hathor. Some people have said this as the wheel of tarot brings order because to cultivate or to grow can also mean to bring order to the world. So it pleads or it asks us to learn the law of of Hathor, the law of the goddess, the law of nature, okay? The word nature, mother nature, netter, means God in Egyptian, N-T-R, again, dropping the vowel sounds, netter, okay? It, it was actually not pronounced netter. That's the uh, English equivalency phonetically. It was actually pronounced netcher. The T is a Ch sound, hard, like T-C-H, netcher. That's how it was actually pronounced in ancient Egypt, netcher. So think about it. It's so close to nature. Adjust the vowel sounds change. That's all. Again, you'll see that in a, as a continuous theme as you go through, you know, ancient language and, and names. The, the consonants remain, the vowels are interchangeable. Because many, uh, you know, Phonetic uh, languages and, and, and alphabets back then didn't really have vowels like Hebrew, okay? Uh, Coptic, Egyptian, etc. They're just consonants for the most part. So that's the literal translation. The wheel of tarot cultivates. It pleads the law of Hathor. Or, as I like to say it, the wheel of tarot brings order by asking us to learn natural law. That is exactly what the word tarot means, and that is exactly what the tarot deck does. That's what it teaches, if it's properly understood. So, let's jump into its sister science, occultically. That if you don't understand, you don't understand tarot. Again, they have to be studied invariably, inseparably. You start to try to separate these two occult sciences, you're turning them on their head, and one is not going to make sense without the other. So let's look into what Kabbalah really is. And I've done whole shows on Kabbalah, but so I'm just going to very briefly review. And hold on, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. There we go. So... Kabbalah, there written in Hebrew, means reception. Kabbalah, now, the word reception in Hebrew, Kabbalah actually comes from the verb to receive. Okay, that's what it means, to receive. But, if you really want to get down to the proper esoteric uh, connotation of the word, it means Proper reception. It really means to prepare oneself in the correct way so as to be able to receive truth. That's what Kabbalah really means. In, in its way down deep esoteric translation, if you want to properly translate the word Kabbalah, it means proper reception through proper preparation. That's really what Kabbalah means, esoterically, okay? So you're preparing your own mind to be able to receive the truth. So how does Kabbalah do that? How does this occult tradition actually do that? This has been called the root of the Western mystery traditions of occultism because it comes out of very old Hebraic tradition from the Levant area and then back out into, the, uh, you know, into ancient Egypt, Okay, so 
it does this through a system of correspondences. Some people have described Kabbalah of, as having so many correspondences, twists and turns, symbolically, um, you know, uh, in, in um, creating correlational thinking, that they say it bends the mind almost, it bends the rational mind almost into a pretzel, okay? There's so many twists, turns, variations, and different correlations and correspondences that eventually the left brain says, I can't deal with this. It's too much. That's what it's actually designed to do. It's designed to put us in that receptive, open, heart based intelligence if we go deep enough into it super left brain people go and look at kabbalah and go oh this is some ancient uh, quaint religious tradition with all these names for this different stuff that you have to learn who who wants to deal with that it's all nonsense anyway that's what the overly left brain in a left brain prison people among us will do those who are in that left brain prison but those who will go deeper into it, who have the will to, to traverse this occult tradition, it will eventually say, to, the left brain will say, I can't take this anymore. And it will get step out of the way. And that's when the real learning can begin. Because what that does is it prepares the way through preparing the heart. And we start to step into heart-based intelligence. And then the tradition starts to really speak to us. Okay, so... Let's continue with this explanation of what Kabbalah is. Kabbalah is an ancient system of Hebraic esoteric teachings communicated to its initiates through symbols and correspondences. The most well-known and significant aspect of Kabbalistic symbolism is the Tree of Life. This is called the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. It's also referred to as the Sephirotic Tree of Life formed by ten sephirot, or emanations. So these spheres on the tree of life are known as sephirot. That's the plural. Singular is sephira. Uh, and it me they mean emanations. Sephirot means emanations. Okay, something that is being emitted from or growing out of. Okay? So they are connected by 22 paths the straight line bars on the tree of life that create its branches or its paths. And of course, the 22 paths actually represent the tarot major arcana. So the major arcana can actually be lay upon the branches of the tree of life. But a lot of times people don't understand that the emanations itself or the sephirot also represent the major arcana of the tree of life. So you have 22 paths, but if you duplicate the tree and you count the dot sphere, you also have 22 spheres. You don't have 22 sephirot. You have 20 sephirot if you, if you double this and you take one tree to be the microcosmic tree, one tree to be the macrocosmic tree, you will have 20 sephirot, which is cards 1 through 20, and you will have two cards in the major arcana, the, set, the last two of the 22 of the major arcana, that would represent the dot sphere, respectively. One on the microcosmic tree, representing the soul, or the fool card. One on the macrocosmic tree, representing the universe, or the world card. So in some decks, it's referred to as the Aeon. Okay? So, the Sephirot correspond to various aspects of human mental and emotional characteristics. An, 11, an 11th sphere named Da'at is not cons considered as one of the Sephirot, but rather as the place from which the entire tree grows or emanates, corresponding to the realm of hidden or occulted knowledge. Da'at means knowledge. So the Da'at position is on both trees that we're going to look at, the microcosmic and macrocosmic trees of life, is knowledge respectively of 
the minor arcana, or the world of inner knowledge, or the knowledge of self, and the major arcana, or the so-called outer world, the macrocosmic world, the knowledge of the universe and its universal laws. So already we're seeing deep correspondences between Kabbalah and Tarot. 22 spheres. Okay, we take card 0 and card 21, separate them from the 22 cards of the major arcana. The cards numbered 1 through 20 represent, if we duplicate the tree, okay, Kabbalah always talks about the two trees, not just one, okay? The book of Revelations talks about two trees, not just one, okay? There's the microcosmic and the macrocosmic, the minor arcana, the major arcana. Okay, you break the major arcana down, 22 cards, two in the knowledge, occult knowledge position, okay? And then the other 20 on the spheres known as the sephirot, on the sephirotic tree of life. You see the correspondences of the both the Kabbalistic tradition and the Tarot tradition in the ancient Indus Valley uh, tradition known as the Vedas, which is which also means knowledge. You're going to see this over and over again if you start studying the occult. It doesn't mean belief. It doesn't mean religion. It doesn't mean accept this as because we say it is. It means this is a science that you can study and come to understand. And it's all about you. It's all about us, our place in the universe, how we work, how the laws of nature work. All things that could come to be known. Knowledge. The Vedas, one of the most ancient forms of occult knowledge from the Indus Valley traditions, deriving out of the ancient goddess tradition as well means knowledge. The word Vedas means collection of knowledge. Right in the word. Okay? And from part of the system of correspondences that come from the Vedic tradition is known as the symbol of wheels or chakras. Again, you're going to see correspondence to the aspect of the wheel again, which the tarot has been called a wheel. Okay? It's a system of wheels. Just like the chakra is a system of energetic or vortex wheels within the body corresponding to um, glandular activity at different places where glands produce energy in our body. And electromagnetic forces are generated within the body. Actual whole electromagnetic fields are produced and actually known through science. The three biggest electromagnetic fields in the entire body are number one, the heart, number two, the brain, and number three, the intestinal system, the digestive system, which is the root of the immune system. In the Vedic tradition, they teach of seven major chakras and then other traditions and variants, you know, will go into other more subtle chakras that extend even above and below the body, but within it. Um, we are talking about the seven major chakras, starting at the root chakra and progressing up to the top of the head, which is called the crown chakra. So you have the root, the sacrum, the solar plexus, the heart, the throat, the third eye, and the crown. In the Vedic tradition, uh, these are known as the Muladhara chakra, the Swadhisthara chakra, the Manipura chakra, the Anahata chakra, the Vishuddha Chakra, the Anya Chakra, and the Sahasrara Chakra. So, if we look at the Tree of Life, and I've color-coded my variation here of the tree to correspond with the Vedic Chakra system, we can see that it has seven levels, just like there are seven chakras in the Vedic system of chakras. This tree in the Kabbalistic tradition has been called both the tree of life and the ladder to God. That's another name for it. It's been called the ladder to God in the Kabbalistic tradition because it has rungs that we climb to get from the root or base chakra all the way up to, which represents staying in base consciousness, in low vibratory consciousness. Uh, we climb the chakras as a rung system 
of a ladder, you know, one upon the other to build the energy known as Kundalini, which then can take us all the way to what has been referred to as godlike consciousness or enlightened consciousness at the crown chakra, at the top. So the root chakra would correspond to Malkuth or kingdom. I'm going to go through the Hebrew names of the Sephirot on the Kabbalistic tree of life. This is going to be very important when we lay the cards down upon these spheres so that you understand what they correspond to. The root chakra is base consciousness, but it's also anchoring in the physical world. It's also about the physical resources and characteristics that we have at our disposal, which are necessary to perform the great work. It isn't like throw out Malkuth, throw out the kingdom, throw out the root chakra. That's an anchoring point. It's needed because the work is to be done here on the earth, not in some etheric realm you know, of imagination only. You know, too many so-called spiritualists and spiritual teachers don't understand that. You know, and they don't get into that this is boots on the ground spirituality. What you learn in, you know, spiritual teaching has to be taken back upon the earth and you need to put your feet right on the ground, anchored firmly and do the work here. You know, that's real world spirituality. Streetwise spirituality, as I like to call it. So Malkuth or kingdom is the first level out of these seven levels. And it represents base consciousness, material consciousness, but also just it's that sort of that, you know, earth element. Okay, it's anchoring to the earth. It means that we do the work here in the here and now. And we have to be present in the here and now. So that anchoring is important. And it's not to be discounted or shunned. It's not a bad thing. If we only stay there, then it turns into greed, materialism, staying in low vibratory consciousness, etc. Then it becomes a bad thing. But it's necessary to do the work. To have that anchoring present. So, yesod, meaning foundation, is the next level up. That's the next rung up on the ladder to God. Okay, on the tree of life. This corresponds in the Vedic tradition with the sacrum chakra. So this would be the, um, the genital chakra. It would be at the area of the genitals. Okay. And this is called the desire center, the desire chakra. Now, again, it can be, it, the, you'll notice that the levels are both unitary and dual. We're going to talk a lot about that. So this is a unitary chakra because it's desire in any form, okay? That could be lo low base desires, you know, which we all struggle with and some people let take over themselves, okay? But, you know, they could be dealt with and expressed, you know, or they could be suppressed and then they could, you know, rule us. And then it could be desire for something higher. You know, yes, sold foundation, desire, however you want to refer to it. It could be desire to improve oneself. It could be desire to obtain greater knowledge about how we work and how our reality works. So this is coming out of pure base consciousness or material plane identification and saying, I want to know more. I want to go further in my understanding. I want to know more about how I work. I want to know more about the self and I want to know more about how the laws of nature work. I want to learn more about the universe and, and the forces that are within it. So that's that second rung. Okay. And we're going to go up to the third rung. Okay. And I'll talk about the vertical pathways in a moment. The pillars, uh, the left hand path, the right hand path and the middle path or the center path also known as the pillar of severity, the pillar of mercy, and the pillar of mildness, as I have labeled them here in the Kabbalistic tradition. And we'll talk about what they mean and their correspondences. But let's look at this third rung or third chakra, the solar plexus chakra. Now here you'll see it's the third rung of the tree of life. 
and it's dual. There's a left side and a right side to it. There's a masculine and feminine. The feminine aspect, okay, would be hod or majesty on the left-hand side of the tree of life or the pillar of severity. These are the inward qualities. The, the feminine aspects of the tree of life are on the left-hand side. The masculine aspects are on the right-hand side in this system of correspondences. So hod or majesty uh, represents courage, internal will. Because courage is something you, you don't really see in the external world. That's something that has to be developed inwardly. You can't take a picture of courage. You could take a picture of someone acting with courage, but courage is a, a, a force that we have within ourselves. It's an aspect of our consciousness and our personality that must be developed within. It's an inward quality. Hence, it's on the feminine, the base of the feminine pillar. Okay? And, you know, this is the will center, the solar plexus, our guts. Look at where it's positioned. You know, the chakra is at the guts. Okay, the solar plexus, the sun, okay? One aspect of the sun. The, the real sun is the heart, as we're going to see, the center of it all. But Hoder majesty is courage on the tree of life, okay? And it's, it shares the same rung level, the same rung on the ladder to God as Netzah, or endurance. And this is willpower, Okay, so again, we have the solar plexus or willpower center, which is twofold. It has a feminine aspect, which is internal, which is courage on the left-hand path of the tree of life. And then we have the willpower center, netzah or endurance in Hebrew, on the right-hand or masculine side, the will to act in the world. Again, in this system of correspondences in Kabbalah, you cannot look at the feminine pillar or the pillar of severity as negative. That's not what we're, we're not talking about negative versus positive. We're talking about feminine versus masculine or internal versus external factors. The pillar of mercy is the masculine pillar. Okay. The pillar of severity, the feminine pillar and the one which we bridge the masculine and feminine and combine them into one holistic uh, unity is the pillar of mildness or the center path. So going up one rung to the heart chakra, the Anahata chakra in the Vedic system, on the tree of life, the correspondence is the Sephirah known as Tiferet. Tiferet is beauty or the heart. Okay. Unified because it's all about care. This is a unity chakra that's the most important of all of the, them on the tree of life because it is the center of everything. This is the generative principle. So it's the heart. Care for truth. Care to know. Care to actually determine the difference between right and wrong behavior. Care to act with right instead of transgress against natural law and act in wrongdoing. So that's the heart chakra. That's the real son of the whole tree. You know, if we could look at the solar system correspondences and the astrological correspondences and Tiferet would correspond in that system of correspondences to the sun because it's the center of the whole solar system of the self. Moving upward to the throat chakra. Again, I hope the color coding helps to clarify where we're at. You know, this is that blue chakra. The Tiferet or heart chakra was green. Okay, moving up to the throat chakra in the Vedic tradition, in the Kabbalistic system, this corresponds with the, the dual rung on the tree of life of um, Geburah, which is strength, and Hesed, which is compassion. Uh, this has also been translated, Geburah can also be translated as severity, because it's the center of the pillar of severity, and Hesed, compassion, or mercy. It can be translated as mercy in Hebrew. Okay? So, what these really represent in the Kabbalistic tradition, Geburah or strength represents internal willpower to change. 
Okay, so this is doing work upon ourselves. Okay, you, willpower is even the wrong word to look at it. It's internal influence. Our internal dialogue that we have with ourselves that encourages us to change for the better. So we're having severity with ourself. We're, ha we're having strength to change internally. It's internal influence to change ourselves. That voice that says, see, it's the, the voice, right? It's the throat chakra. It's the voice that says to ourself, we need to be better. We should improve. I want to do better. I want to improve myself. See, that's why it's severity. It's severity upon the self, right? And then has said is the external or masculine quality. Again, always on the left hand path, you're going to see in this system of correspondences, the internal characteristics, the feminine aspect when we go internal to the self. And then on the right hand path, we're going to see how do we interact with the world? So you saw netza or endurance was willpower, will to act in the world. So has said compassion or mercy is how are we influencing others around us because we see that they also must change for the better. That we are all not where we need to be. But we have to get ourselves together first. You know, we have to use that internal dialogue, improve ourselves, then help or influence others to change with the power of our voice. We can't do it for them ourselves, but we can, through our voice, the throat chakra, help to influence them to change. That's a huge part of the great work. Think about how perfect the system of correspondence already is. If you understand, and we haven't even started laying the tarot cards down to see the symbolism used to represent these aspects of Kabbalah. Okay? I'm just explaining what they mean in Kabbalistic terms when you study Kabbalah isolated. Wait till you see how perfect the correspondences are for those who may not have seen this. You know, for those who have, it'll be a review and that's fine. You'll, you'll learn it at an even deeper level when you review it. But for those who haven't seen it, when you see the system of correspondences, is like the first time I ever saw this, it melted my brain. It melted my mind down. Because I just could not believe that they perfectly depicted this in, in the tarot tradition. So, you know, we're talking about influencing the self and influencing others with the power of the voice. Whether it be external dialogue or actually speaking to others, you know, with our actual voice. Hence the throat chakra, that blue rung of the ladder. Now, dot, we pass that, the, the realm of the abyss or hidden knowledge. Okay, as we go up to the sixth rung of the tree. Okay, so that would be um, the indigo level. So we're at blue, now we're in a deep blue, almost to a, a, a purple, you know, or a violet. Um, so we're at what would be called indigo. So we have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, or purple. Okay, so the indigo level is also dual. It's Bina and Hokmah. But before I do that, let me just briefly talk about Da'at. Da'at, as a Hebrew word, means knowledge. So we are entering the realm of the trivium now. The trivium is depicted right underneath of the crown chakra. The three, I'm just going to point it out with my mouse here. The three spheres that represent the trivium here are Da'at, Bina and Hokmah. What is the trivium? Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. What do they form? They form a triumvirate or a triangle inverted which represents the grail. Connected to, at its base, the heart chakra. Care for truth. I mean, imagine this, how perfect that is, you know? And it can be filled with knowledge. Dot. We have to pass through knowledge to get to understanding and wisdom. And it's hidden. It's not a physical part of the tree. It is considered the place of life from which the tree grows. Knowledge. It's not one of the sephirot. It is not a sephirah. Dot. To consider it one of the sephirah is considered blasphemic in the uh, ancient Hebraic tradition of Kabbalah. This is why they called the ritual event 9-11. You know, it's warned about in the Zohar to never refer to as any more or any less sephirot as 10. 
not nine, not 11. So this is a big, you know, blasphemic, you know, destruction of the tree of life, destruction of knowledge, putting us into fear, which destroys our ability to understand and then to act correctly, which is wisdom. That's what 9-11 was all about, the destruction of the three pillars, the three towers, buildings one and two and building seven, the middle pillar. What's the one, two, and seven equal? Ten. The destruction of the ten sephirotes on the tree of life. We've been through that system of symbolic correspondences regarding 9-11, which was a huge satanic ritual. To destroy the ladder to God and close it all down and keep us in Malkuth, in the kingdom run by the Satanists. Not the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of slavery. So... We have the trivium as the tool set that leads us to the crown chakra. And see, I'm going to show you how the energy flows through the tree of life, the kundalini energy. And when we get to that, we have to understand, you know, with some people that opens erratically. With some people it opens slowly and it was a process, okay? And the process could take years for that to open. And then when it opens, it's a slow, steady fountain. And it's not this huge explosion that happen, happens all at once and can be very disturbing and traumatic, you know? And often will represent some sort of a blockage, okay? When energy bursts forth, usually something blocked it prior, okay? What we want to build toward here is a slow expanding of that kundalini energy and a slow progression of our understanding because we have the will to keep going and keep going. And we work upon ourselves a little at a time until we get to a position of strength and eventually that kundalini energy builds as a slow, steady, consistent force. That's the goal. That's what the correct opening up and reception means that we eventually evolve to. Okay, so the trivium is up here. And it starts with knowledge, da'at. This is all about knowledge of the self. And that's not in the physical domain. It grows, it, the soul is in the realm of the hidden, the spiritual. True spiritual knowledge. And the whole tree grows from that. We are in the world where the ten emanations are, the sephirot. We are having an experience, a spiritual experience of the soul in the physical domain. And the sephirot are the expressions of that experience or the emanations of that experience. Yeah. So, we then go up to the sixth rung of the ladder represented in the indigo color here which represents the third eye chakra. And that's all about the mind, right? Understanding and wisdom. Okay, these are mental qualities Okay, so the, the base of the tree of life, that would be coins of the minor arcana. That would be earth, right? We went up to the will center, right? That's wands or fire, right? The compassion or working, you know, the heart chakra and working upon ourselves and others. That's all part of cups or that's the water aspect, okay? And then we have knowledge. That's the air what we have to we have to come to know what's going on and then we need to do something with it okay so bina is the internal characteristic of that that's understanding and i i would call it just that i wouldn't change the word at all or use a different word to explain it that's the when we take knowledge into ourselves it means we've come to understand what it means knowledge itself is just the building blocks that's the grammar so this would be the logic or understanding aspect of the trivium. Then, and that's why it's on the feminine or left-hand pillar. The right-hand or masculine pillar is what we do with what we have come to know. And that's what wisdom actually is. Wisdom isn't um, just knowledge itself. It's knowledge actively applied in the world for the right reasons. Putting it into knowledge correctly. That's what wisdom really is. It's doing the right thing with what we have come to know and to understand. 
That's why it's on the masculine pillar. Wisdom is action. And it sits at the top of the masculine pillar of action. So on the left-hand path, or the feminine side, the pillar of severity, as it's called in Kabbalah, you have the courage to act, influencing the self, and how we work upon the self, and the understanding. So you could really say that we have to have understanding and courage, and then they come together in a synthesis, okay, to improve ourselves. And then you have to do something with that in the world. So you have to have the will to act in the world. You have to help others, okay, and you have to do the right thing. So it's willpower, netzah, compassion for others to help others to do the work and to tell them what they need to know, to speak the truth into the world. That's hesed, compassion, mercy. Okay? And then, of course, wisdom. Doing the right thing with what we have come to know and to understand. That's the active or masculine pillar that puts it all out into the world. I hope people can just appreciate just from that the phenomenal system of correspondences that is part of this deeply esoteric, rich system of symbolism and correlation that's to be found in the occult traditions. Most people have never seen that in their lives, never understand that in their lives or what it means. And it's sad. It's sad that we're discouraged from looking at that. And let me tell you something, folks. Some Kabbalists who teach Kabbalah are not teaching this. They're charlatans. And they're not teaching the real tradition. Just like Freemasons, in many cases, are charlatans. And they are not teaching the true Freemasonic tradition. Just like many Rosicrucians are charlatans in the modern world. And they are not teaching the true Rosicrucian knowledge. Just like many so-called tarot practitioners aren't teaching tarot. Not even a little bit. They're charlatans. They're not giving you the real knowledge. They're teaching you what they want you to believe that it is. And then other people just go and believe, oh, they said that's what it is. They're the experts, and they have no idea what they're talking about. Actually, they do have an idea. They do know this. And they're telling you that it's something else to get you to believe that it's something else, just like Satanists will tell you Satanism is something else and give you the Hollywood variant of it so you never come to understand the real thing. They're giving you the proxy so you never study the real Given you the artificial or the ancillary so you never get to the real esoteric understanding of it. They're reserving that for themselves so that they can use this knowledge as a weapon against you and all the rest of the ignorant masses of humanity. And I, again, I'm going to reiterate it. The people who really take my work seriously and who are serious students of it, I'm not referring to you guys. But the religionists out there who look at this as passing... It, ancillary information to your religious bullshit beliefs and you go right back to the queen's chamber of going to church every Sunday and thinking you're a good Christian okay and saying oh you know I just wanted to hear what he had to say about the Satanists who run the world and then you want to poo poo this and say there's nothing of any significance or value to be found in it you don't know what the fuck you're talking about at all not even a tiny little bit and by poo-pooing it and by telling other people they don't need to know about it, you're doing a, you're keeping other, you're helping to keep people in slavery. Just flat out, that's what you're doing. And encouraging just belief in some external savior. You are part of the problem. You are working with the dark forces. You're working with the Satanists, whether you know it or not. Because that's exactly where they want all of the world and its people. In abject ignorance, never understanding what they know, never understanding how the psyche works, never understanding how the laws of nature work so that they can keep fucking ruling you and me, unfortunately. And you want to say, oh no, my religion is just completely right and there's nothing to the occult. How about say nothing at all? If you're going to spout pure, ignorant garbage out of your mouth. Okay? 
Don't try to put down real knowledge and someone who's trying to convey it for the betterment of humanity so we can get the fuck out of slavery. Okay, I'm personally tired of hearing it. Spout it somewhere else. Don't write it to me. I'm not interested in hearing your bullshit. Okay? I just want to say that out in the open, in plain language, is very easy for people to understand because I'm tired of religionists and I don't want to hear your fucking nonsense anymore. Quite frankly. I don't even want to hear it. I know what I'm talking about and you don't. Let, let's have the straight up budding egos. Okay? Straight up let's bud ego like Brahma bulls. I know what I'm talking about. You fucking don't. And I don't want to hear your bullshit anymore. Don't bring it to me. Go spout it somewhere fucking else. All right? Because you know what? A lot, what a lot of people don't see, folks, is the shit I deal with to do this shit. To bring this knowledge to people. Right? And they think, oh, oh, you should just, it should never get bother you or, or, or do any, anything to make you upset. Well, that's called not being human. That's called being a robot. Especially when you hear from people that know absolutely nothing. Yeah, keep it on me during this rant for a minute because I'm going to fix a slide real quick. Okay, while I talk about this. Picture people who know absolutely nothing what they're talking about. You know that they have absolutely no clue what they are referring to the second they open their ignorant mouth. And you're an expert on something that has studied it the vast majority of, your, of the time of your life. And some know-nothing imbecile starts wanting to spout nonsense to you as if they know what you're talking about. When you can tell in the first 10 seconds that they begin to speak that they have looked at no part of it. Could you imagine this? Just imagine. Imagine if you're a computer expert. Imagine if you're a programmer, right? And let's say you program in uh, JavaScript, Okay, and you know, you've written the book on JavaScript. There is nothing you cannot program in it. You are a, the highest level expert in the JavaScript programming language that basically exists on the earth. And you walk into a bar and you sit down and some fucking imbecile next to you goes, what the hell is JavaScript? But in the next breath, he says to you, let me tell you all about what I think it is. And he starts spouting. 100% complete inaccuracies about what it really is and then telling you he knows more about it than you do. That's what I deal with almost every fucking day. Almost every day. Think about how sick of that you would get if you made something your life study and then jerk-offs who have never looked into it because you'll ask them the simplest questions about it or the si say, what have you ever read on the topic? Do you, are you familiar with this work? Are you familiar with this work? Are you familiar with this work? No, 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 no. I know nothing about it. I've studied nothing about it. But I'm going to tell you everything there is to know about it. And I'm going to tell you you're wrong. Could you imagine the height of hubris that someone has to be existing in to believe that they have knowledge that they don't? And again, that's what I call negative knowledge. You're nowhere even in the realm of knowledge. You're in a belief system of what you think you know. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, invariably, I'm going to come out harder and harder core every week to really just lay the absolute smack down upon the people who are giving me this shit dynamic. And invariably, you know who they are? They're people who have bought into modern world religions. The cultural religions. And almost invariably, they're fake-ass Christians. You get some, some Jewish people who are in that mindset. Very few Islamicists really even write to me, to be honest with you. And generally, they haven't really studied this tradition if they come from that background, usually, unfortunately. But I get a lot of fake-ass Christians that don't know anything about their own tradition, quite frankly, that I could school them on the Christian tradition infinitely more than they're aware of, okay? And they want to tell me about the occult and what it is. And they're fucking know-nothings. So the gloves are off. And I'm just going to say it in plain street language. You don't know what you're talking about. 
and I don't want to hear your shit anymore. I'm tired. of. Don't write to me. Go write to somebody else and waste their time. When I get garbage like that, it goes in a block list and you can write to me infinitely. Think your message is getting through. I will never see it. That's what happens. I open up a rule, I paste your email address in, I hit save, and that's the end of you. You could you could write to any of my email addresses, it goes in a block list and I never see it. I don't ever even see it in the inbox. It gets deleted upon receipt. As soon as it's received, it's immediately deleted. Not put in the trash for me to even look at in the trash can. If I want to go look at false positives, it's instantaneously deleted once I realize you're that much of a jackass. That's what I do because I don't have time for that. So don't even make me have to do that. Study it for yourself instead of having a belief about it. This is what too many people do. They develop a belief based on what's written about a topic instead of actually studying the thing itself. That's like going, well, you know, uh, Pink Lady Apples, I've read about them, so I know everything there is to know about how they taste. Well, until you've experienced it yourself, no, you don't. You haven't gone into that experience. Stop reading about from someone else what it's all about and actually experience it. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. I want to show people the movement. First of all, I want to show people the numbering system of the Kabbalistic tree because that's very important and I want to show people the movement I, I didn't take care of the last chakra I'm sorry we go to the seventh and top chakra on the Vedic system of chakras which is the top of the tree of life which is Keter or the crown okay Keter means crown and that's what it's also called in the Vedic system of chakras and this is godlike consciousness but, you know, it doesn't mean you know everything that there is to know about creation and the universe. It just means that you are in human form embodying higher consciousness. You've gone from beast consciousness to enlightened consciousness. That's all. It's not to be looked at as your God walking incarnate on the earth. Like, don't twist it into something that it doesn't mean. Too many people take this, you know... Uh, idea of the crown chakra or keter on the tree of life to mean like man has become God. No, it does not mean that. That would be Satanism. Okay? It means we are embodying the higher laws of creation here upon the earth. We are putting the plan of God, if you will, into effect in the physical world. We are doing the will of creation, as I, I would say. That's how I would word it. Okay? We are aligning ourselves to natural law and living it in its fullness. Okay, that would be what Keter really means and how it is represented in the world. So let's look at the numbering system of, chakra, of um, Sephirot, which is very important to understand the progression of energy uh, that this represents, because this is really the human spinal column as well, from the base to the top of the head, the center of the body. Okay? So, this is the numbering system on the Kabbalistic tree of life, which is going to become very important when we lay the tarot cards down on these emanations or sephirot. Okay? So, keter, or crown, is one. Hokmah, or wisdom, is two. Bina, or understanding, is three. We pass through dat to hesed, which is sphere number four, compassion. Then to Geberah, five, that's strength. Tiferet, beauty, the heart chakra is six right in the middle. And you'll see we're making like a lightning bolt pattern. Starting at the top, then to the right. It's a dual chakra, so we go to the left. Then we're going to go back to the right. It's another dual chakra, so we go to the left to number five. Then we're going to go again toward the right, so we have to pass through Tiferet, which is six. Then again toward the right. Okay, so here's, I'll bring my mouse back up on the screen if I can. There we go. So we're making a lightning bolt pattern. One, two, three, four, five, six, Tiferet, Netzah, seven, Endurance, Hode, Majesty, eight. Continuing with that lightning bolt pattern, nine, Yesod, Foundation, and then at the base, the bottom, Malkuth or Kingdom, number ten. Okay. 
the energy that rises from the base of the spine and wraps all the way around the spinal column in a, in a, uh, in a spiral progression has been called in the Vedic tradition and also in the, the Kabbalistic tradition, the Kundalini energy. As a matter of fact, they call it, um, uh, uh, I think it's called Veda Kundalini or uh, Devi Kundalini. Devi Kundalini. It's referred to in the Vedic system. Okay, Devi Kundalini is this energy. It's this this flow upward of the energy up the ladder of God, the spinal column to the to the brain, and then out the top of the head. Okay, so here's how it progresses. I'm going to play this quick animation to show you the progression of the Kundalini energy from the base of the spine to the top of the head. It starts at Malkuth or Kingdom, the base chakra, and we're going to go up in that lightning bolt pattern from 10 up through 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, all the way up to the top of the top of the tree of life, Keter or the crown chakra in the Vedic tradition. This is why the Sephirotic tree of life in the Kabbalistic tradition has also been referred to as the thunderstruck tree. Okay, or the lightning struck tree. It's a lightning pattern. Lightning hitting the tree. Okay, you'll see this in, there's a movie um, entrance to some um, movie studio that has lightning hitting a tree. That's the producer of that studio telling you he's a Kabbalist, covertly. Anytime you're going to see the lightning struck tree, that's a symbol of the Kabbalistic occult tradition. Because that's what, it, what, what we're talking about. We're talking about that kundalini energy rising from the base chakra to the crown chakra. Okay, so keep this progression in mind when we go to show how Kabbalah and the tree of life corresponds to the major arcana of the tarot deck. So this is the microcosmic tree of life with the first 11 tarot cards of the major arcana put upon, laid down upon the sephirot on the Kabbalistic tree. Okay, so there's two trees. We're going to do this twice. The macrocosmic, the, the microcosmic and the macrocosmic. This one here is the microcosmic tree. So let's look at the system of correspondence. Okay. All we've done is taken card zero, which is the fool, okay, or the soul, more properly understood, the soul card, okay, we are putting that at the dot position. So we're removing it from the numbered cards of one through ten. Then we're just taking cards one through ten and we're putting them down at the same numbered areas. I should have kept the numbers on this slide. Um, as a matter of fact, cut away for a second, back to me, and I'll just talk while I do this real quick. Okay, I'm just going to put these numbers on this side of the tree very quickly. Just give me a moment. And I think we'll have a better understanding of the correspondences here. As a matter of fact, I'm going to also duplicate them onto the other side so we very clearly have, I think this is going to be a much better, let's see what this slide looks like now. Switch back to it please. So just uh, making some uh, changes right on the fly to just show you the system of correspondence is a little bit better. Okay, so you just take the major arcana, you put the zero card at the dot position, and then you're going to lay down the other cards just in the order that we looked at of the numbering system of the sephirot, one through ten. Okay, now look at what you have. Okay, so we're going to step through this, okay, to show you the correspondences. All right, so let's move this to the other side. And again, we're going to do this twice. We're going to do this both with the microcosmic tree of life and the macrocosmic tree of life. 
All right, we'll do the microcosmic first. So let's look at the progression as we move through the path of the soul. Some people have called this the path of the fool, but more properly understood, it's the path of the soul, okay, in the physical domain. So here we go. So this is the fool card, all right, or the soul card, and it's at the dot position. We lay that at the dot position. Well, what you really have to do to study this is lay it out yourself. Don't just look at my slides. Get a tarot deck, you know, a decent one, and lay the cards out in this progression on a table. Like, you know, clear off, you know, your living room table or your kitchen table and just lay the cards actually in the Kabbalistic tree in this order. All right, so the, the soul card, as I'm calling it, at the dot position circled there on the microcosmic tree of life. This is the soul. This is the journey of the spirit in the world. Okay? So it's called the fool because anyone would have to be a damn fool to come and incarnate on the earth. Okay? I, I love how David Icke often words it. You know, he says, we were all lined up in the, in the uh, before life, you know, before we all incarnated here on the earth. And, um, you know, in this pure realm of spirit, we're all lined up in a line together, shoulder to shoulder. And suddenly a big voice comes down and says, volunteers for earth, please. And everyone else in the line took a step backwards except me. <laughs> you know, that's how much of a fool you have to be to come to this prison, you know, to try to help the absolute lunatics of this lunatic asylum. Okay. But this is what we do. Those of us who are here to teach. So. Again, it's the zero card. It can't be numbered. It's infinite. There's no beginning and no end. That's the soul. Okay? It's not of this world. It's the cosmic egg from which everything is born. The cosmic void. The no thing. Okay? The nothing. This is the, so the solar card as well. There is a sun card on the major arcana as well, but this... Uh, could also represent the great sun, you know, the soul, the idea in Thelema uh, that every man and woman is a star. We're also seeing this, that we come from star matter, okay? And we're traveling light. We're light travelers. That's the idea of the soul. We're not taking anything with us, folks. We're basically leaving what, what we came with, which is nothing, you know? And nature should be in our hand and at our side, represented by the animal kingdom. We should be fellow travelers with them on a journey of soul progression. These are the nature forces that go, that travel along with us. And it's a leap of faith into the world, represented by the fool stepping off the cliff. So powerful symbolism in the deck already. You know, clearly showing us that this is the soul or the spirit. And it's about its progression in the world. So how does this progression happen? It goes backwards through the sephirot from 10 all the way up through 1. Because it's a journey that starts in ignorance. The wheel of fortune, which we've already talked about as base consciousness. Where is it at? On the Malkuth position of the tree of life. Sphere number 10. Okay? Think about it. And it's card number 10. They're telling you the position on the tree of life. You got to put it in the 10th position. The bottom sephirot, Malkut. And it means if you stay in ignorance, you remain in base consciousness in life. And you don't make any soul progression. You know, and you're going back and doing it again. You know, people think it's one and done. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. It'll be a great recycling. You'll go, you'll stay on the wheel. The wheel of karma and the wheel of incarnation, of reincarnation. Okay, that's what that jackal force represents. That's the wheel of incarnation, of reincarnation. And you will go round and round and round until you get the lessons that are to be learned here. This is a school. 
it's a school from which like you can be left back and have to do the the course again the you know the uh the level again but you you will not be kicked out you can't be kicked out you know all you could do is have to go back and repeat the lesson that's the wheel of karma the wheel of fortune it's it's just so self-evident once you really start looking at it, but no one started, hardly, and I shouldn't use the word no one, that's a bad blanket statement, hardly anyone studies the tarot this way. You know, people have a very rudimentary understanding of it at best, and a completely inaccurate understanding of it at worst. So, this is the Wheel of Fortune card, staying in base consciousness, staying in ignorance, in which case our lives are going to be a crapshoot, it's going to be a spin of a roulette wheel. You know, it's a chance that we're taking. It's not guided through proper reception of knowledge, which is what Kabbalah is there to teach us to do, to guide our lives through knowledge, through, through understanding, through wisdom, which are knowable. And it's repeatable. This is a science of how we can receive certain consequences in our lives and not be at the mercy of forces that we don't understand. So as the soul progresses through its journey on the Kabbalistic tree of life, we start to elevate up the rungs of the tree of life. And we get to that yesod or foundation position out of that Malkuth or kingdom position, earth identified, material identified awareness, we're up at yesod. So this would represent the journey to uh, out of Asiya into Yetzirah on the Kabbalistic tree of life. And then the two worlds above would be Bria and Atziluth. We've talked about that before uh, in breakdowns of Kabbalah and its worlds on what on earth is happening. This is the Hermit card, number nine, placed at the ninth Sephirot position, Sephirah position on the tree of life. And it's the Hermit because it's desire to know. This is what the hermit represents symbolically. The hermit goes off in search of knowledge. He wants to know the truth. So it's in the sacrum chakra or the uh, position of the uh, genital chakra in the chakra system. But what does that mean? We already looked at that correspondence. It means desire. And it means desire to know, desire to learn, and desire to improve oneself. When do you come off the floor of consciousness? When you've developed a desire to improve. It's the same as anything. When does a drug addict start to be healed? When he has the desire to want to be better and not be an addict anymore. When does an ignorant person start to heal themselves of their ignorance? When they have the desire to know the truth. When they develop that desire. So this is the first position that you have to get to to start coming up off the very base, the floor of the house, as they call it in Freemasonry, out of base consciousness in the journey toward higher level consciousness, self-mastery, and knowledge of God, knowledge of how the universe works. And that is symbolically represented, represented in the tarot tradition by the hermit card. Let's move up a rung. So now we're at the solar plexus chakra. Depicted here in the yellow color. It's a dual chakra. Remember we said it represented courage and willpower. And literally, the, the, the position, hod, means strength. And netza means splendor or victory. Or endurance. So look at what, what, where we're at. What does this card represent? The woman and the lion. Courage. Putting, holding open the jaws of a lion, representing courage. This is the courage card, strength. This is one of my two birth cards. Eight, my two cards are eight and twelve. Strength, or courage, and the hanged man, or evolution, or the servant of natural law. I mean, I couldn't have been born on a more appropriate day. Because those two cards are the epitome of the... Uh, symbolizing of my life. So, this position, card number eight, at the hold position, is 
courage. Again, internal dynamic of consciousness on the feminine pillar of the tree of life, the left-hand pillar. The left-hand pillar in this uh, aspect or in this uh, interpretation of the microcosmic tree of life does not mean negative. It means internal or feminine aspect. Okay, the unseen because it's within. Whereas the right-hand path is the seen or acted upon in the world aspect. Okay, so we move forward to card number seven, and that's the chariot. So what does this represent? Driving force or willpower. This is the Netzah card. This is willpower. Endurance. Okay? Victory, they call it in, in some aspects of uh, interpretation of Kabbalah. The, the, the man in the chariot, driving force, you know, with both sacred feminine and masculine sphinxes. You know, driving the chariot forward. This is action in the world. This is the will to act, the will to do something. Okay? This is the conquering, you know, courage is the conquering of fear or acting in spite of fear. This is the conquering of inaction. All right? So this is the conquering of our laziness, the driving force or willpower to actually do something in the real world. Again, it's the active masculine aspect of the solar plexus or of, you know, so that this is why it's on the right side of the tree of life, the active or masculine pillar, the pillar of mercy. We move up to card number six at the sixth position, the sixth sephira on the tree of life. And that's the lovers. What was this in the chakra system of the Vedas? It was the heart chakra right? This is beauty or tiferet, the heart chakra of the tree of life. And it's the lovers, true care, bringing the sacred masculine and feminine forward. The unitary chakra of care, care for truth, care to do the right thing, care to know oneself and to know the forces at work in the world. And there's the depiction Bringing together Adam and Eve, bringing, and you know, you have the two trees right there, the sacred feminine and sacred masculine, guided by higher level forces of natural law, the angelic forces, ultimately, you know, moving people toward the sun, the light, natural law, God. And it's, it's what binds it all and ties it all together. Without that, the whole tree falls apart. The lovers, true care, the generative principle. The correspondences are unbelievable if we know what to look for and if we know how to decode. But if you don't know how to decode, this is a language that's meaningless. You know, it's like someone speaking Russian and you don't never studied a word of it. You know, you have to know how to decode the symbolism through the system of correspondences and where these traditions come from. It's not just random, folks. It's very detailed and very specific, very deliberate. And it's teaching us something about ourselves. You know, I wanted to do this because the evolution card and the involution card came up in this series on Satanism, which we just finished the last few shows. And I wanted to show people that these top level forces are just right under natural law, which is the king of all creation. You know, and that's where this idea of the paths in the tree of life and as a correspondence to the tarot came up. And so I, I wanted to review this material and present some new aspects of it as well. So that's the unitary heart chakra, the lovers. Tiferet position on the tree of life. As we move upward to the throat chakra in the Vedic tradition. We get to the rung on the tree of life known as severity, Geburah. Uh, and what this is, is internal work that we must do upon ourselves. So it's the hierophant or the Pope, the idea of religion governing the spiritual world or the inner world. 
So we shouldn't look at this as a religious leader. This is, this is the influence that we must wield upon our spiritual lives, upon ourselves to improve ourselves internally. Hence, it's on the feminine pillar, and it's that path of severity, the inner work, the shadow work that we must do, which is an internal aspect of ourselves. Hence, it's on the feminine pillar, or the pillar of severity. We must be severe upon ourselves so that we can work upon ourselves to come up to a level of understanding and right action. And we have to have mercy upon others, compassion toward others, because we realize how many people are in a completely degraded state and then we have to have good influence upon them through what we teach in the world and what we speak to them, how we want to influence them. And it, does, it means sometimes you have to have tough love too. It doesn't just mean just be totally compassionate with your voice. It means sometimes you have to say, hey, you're really fucking up and you're fucking other people up, you know? Tough love is part of that dynamic which we're going to get to in a moment represented by the emperor. But the Hierophant or the Pope is, he's the, quote, religious leader in the sense that this is the internal influence or force that we have to wield upon our spiritual lives to work upon ourselves. Okay? And we just talked about that in the Kabbalistic tradition, and this is exactly the correspondence that comes over through the Tarot in the form of the Hierophant or the Pope. Correspondent to that, you have the emperor or the king that is the pope's, you know, compatriot on this rung of the tree of life. So what does this represent? This is the head of government, right? So you have the head of religion and now you have the head of government. But we're not talking about them as external factors. We're talking about the internal worlds of religion and government. We're talking about the monarchies that are internal monarchies. You know, remember I went in, in shows where I talked about natural law and talked about what kind of governments are legitimate and in, illegitimate and all worldly government is illegitimate and worldly spiritual control is illegitimate. But I also said I'm a fan of monarchy and anarchy in those episodes. And people are thinking like, what the hell is this guy talking about? They're the exact opposite. Monarchy is one ruler over everything. And anarchy is no rulers over anything or anyone. And yet I believe in both of those systems of government. I, as a matter of fact, I know they're the only legitimate systems of government. But you have to have monarchy internally and you have to have anarchy externally. And if you don't do the work to, to recognize your sovereignty, which is the shadow work that is going to help you to understand how to become an internal monarch so that only you are ruling your inner world, then you're never going to build external anarchy because that spiritual work has to come first so that we can really be sovereign in the physical world. That shadow work internally has to be done. So going back to this slide, the emperor or king, yes, that's the head of the external worldly government, which is illegitimate. But in this case, it's a correspondent representation to the influence we have to wield over others. See, it's not ruling others, but is it is influencing others in the world through our behavior, the way we live, and through our speech, through our voice. Again, this is the throat chakra. It's the most powerful way of, of uh, doing that work of influencing others is through the way we actually act by example helping other people to become better influencing them to become better by how we act in the world that's what the best quote ruler or king does you know even in a system where people believe that external authority is legitimate we know that it is not but it's the correspondence here that we're talking about. The wise king or wise ruler sets the example. Okay, we're talking about being a wise ruler of self by setting a good example for others in the world and then teaching them wisely with our voice. You know, so this is the active pillar. It's what we do to influence others in the world through our behavior and our voice. Look at the correspondence, how perfect it is. It's, it's un, unwielding. It's invariable. It's exact. The exactitude of symbolic correspondence. You know, 
for the, once again, for those that this is a review, I hope you appreciate the review and how I'm going in depth here. But for those who haven't seen this, I hope it's really taking, blowing the top of your head off. And it should. Because most people will never show you this when it comes to the tarot. Because they don't know it themselves or they don't want you to know it. So then we pass through the realm of dot, the soul, hidden knowledge of the self. That's the first step of the trivium. So the path takes you through the occult world. Now you're getting up to the higher levels of knowledge when you take in the world of the occult, of the self. And now you have an understanding of how you work. This is the empress, okay? So this would be like the queen, okay? And this is internal understanding, the top level of the pillar of severity or the feminine pillar. So once we take in the knowledge, then we come to understand what it means. This is knowledge inwardly applied through logic to become understanding. Our understanding of how our psyche actually works. Hence, it's at the top of that mental plane, the third eye chakra, the indigo level of the tree of life and the chakra system. And again, you know, it's arrived at by care, care to know the truth. You know, you have to get there by way of the heart depicted by that's what she's seated on. That's her foundation, the empress or the queen. And you'll see pomegranates repeated a lot, which is what is on her robe. Kabbalah has been called the garden of pomegranates. You know, if you, that's the original fruit of Eden in, in the ancient, you know, Kabbalistic allegory, not the apple. Because the pomegranate, um, it's a lot of work you have to do to get to the fruit. You know, and the, the seeds only contain a little bit of, of juice and you have to get a lot of them in you to get the, the nutrition and to chew it out, to chew, chew that juice out that it, where the nutrition of it lies. You know, you look at a pomegranate, how much that's encased, those seeds are encased there. So a garden of pomegranates is like you have this gift of all this, this nutrient, these nutrients, but there's going to be work involved to get to it. That's why it's been, Kabbalah has been called that. You have to do a lot of work to get through the system of correspondences to get all the way down to, you know, the, the meat or the juice that you're going to receive as a, as a reward for going through all of that work. So moving to the next aspect of this chakra level or rung level on the tree of life, you get to the high priestess. So this is, you know, getting to really highest levels of the occult and highest levels of initiation. And what we're really talking about here is spreading the knowledge through behavior, through what we do with what we have come to know. See, this is uh, the, um, the um, empress was in the bina position, which means understanding, but the high priestess is in the hokma position. And what does that mean? Wisdom. So this is the active card. It's a, it's a feminine symbol on the card, but what the high priestess is, really is, is the wisdom card. Okay, we could call this the right action in the world card. See, I have to really show people what I would call all these cards. Maybe I'll step through these one, one more time and tell you what I would call them in my deck, okay? But the high priestess, and there you see the pomegranates behind her again. The, the Sephiroth depicted as pomegranates, you know, that showing you that a lot of work's going to have to be done to get at the heart of the matter and to get to that knowledge and then rightly apply it. Okay. So this is wisdom. And again, you see the whole tree of life behind her. You know, she's the, she's the, uh, you know, bringer of that. You know, this came out of her tradition, the goddess tradition. She holds the law, the Torah, because she's Tara. The original name of the goddess, the, the moon goddess, gives birth to the sun. You know, the whole idea of, you know, the Christian allegorical tradition. She has the crescent moon there. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Taurus sign again. There's that TR again, Taurus. You know, the symbol of Taurus rests upon her head. She's Tara. You know, she holds the Torah. The, the correspondences are endless. You know, and then you have the pillar 
of Boaz, the feminine pillar on the left, and the pillar of Joaquin, or Joaquin, the masculine pillar on the right, also referred to as the pillar of beauty and the pillar of strength. So, respectively. So that's wisdom, or what we do with what we know when we are doing the right thing with what we have come to know and to understand. And then we move back up to the magician card, and this is self-mastery. Okay, he is a conduit between the higher world and the earth because he has one arm in the heavens and one arm pointing toward the earth. He's illuminated. He's truly illuminated with the infinity symbol as the halo above his head. Okay, he's bathed in the red robe, which represents the Rubedo stage of alchemy or the development of the philosopher's stone. Okay, crowned with roses. That's very symbolic of the... Uh, the soul's journey through the world, especially in the Rosicrucian tradition. He is whole. He has become one. Okay? And he's the magus or the magician. He has the forces of nature arrayed at his table. He's holding the scepter of power, representing the masculine and feminine forces that he has united. And he has the worldly forces at his table, earth, air, water, and fire, depicted by coins swords, cups, and wands, respectively. This is the self-mastery card, or man with a godly knowledge and attitude in the world doing the great work. So let me just step back briefly. I'm going to go back to the beginning of this section and go through this one more time and just say what I would call these cards, okay? This in my deck is going to be called the soul card to make it very obvious that the path of the soul through the tarot is the fool's journey. That's the, the spirits undertaking in the world through incarnating in the world. So that's the soul card. Okay. The wheel of fortune card is the ignorance card. Okay. This is just staying in ignorance of self. I would probably call this card Ignorance of self would be probably my best name for it and probably what I'll call it in my deck. The hermit card, I will call this desire for truth. That's what the hermit represents. Desire to know the self. Probably in, in the microcosmic tree, the tree of self, it would probably be more accurate to call it desire to know oneself. Okay, or simply desire for truth. This is the courage card. The strength card in my deck is going to be called courage, without a doubt. The chariot card in my deck is going to be called willpower. Willpower. The lover's card is going to be called care, or the generative principle. But I'm simply going to probably call it true care, or just care. The Hierophant card is going to be called self-discipline or self-improvement. Okay? Self-discipline or self-improvement. Or maybe just working upon the self. Uh, let, I'm sorry, let me just step through them. I hit back accidentally. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll call this self-work, maybe. Okay? It could be called shadow work, maybe. But... Self-improvement, I kind of like. I kind of just like the simplicity of that. Self-work or self-improvement. So this is influencing others or setting an example, okay? Or living an example. You know, that's the best way of influencing others. But in general, you have work upon the self and influencing others. Work upon others. This would be simply called understanding in my deck. And this will be called wisdom in my deck. This will be called self-mastery in my deck. The magician will be self-mastery. So those are the names that I would apply to the first 11 cards of the major arcana uh, that we have shown here on the microcosmic tree of life. So... Let's step forward and look at the macrocosmic tree of life next. 
And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to build out the 11 cards of the macrocosmic tree of life. And folks, if we get through it, we get through it. There's less than a half an hour left. If we don't, we'll continue next week. And uh, it, regardless of what happens, we'll wrap this topic up next week and take your calls for the duration of the show. And I think it'd be a very interesting call-in show to just do a whole call-in show on the major arcana of the tarot. Because I know people will have a lot of questions and they probably have a lot of correspondences to bring to the table regarding this extremely rich symbolism. So next week, wrap up of this and call in show for the duration of the show. So let's start with the dot position again, as we did on the microcosmic tree of life. This is the universe card or the world card. I will simply probably call this the universe in my deck, as it is called in many decks. Again, some call it the world, some call it the Aeon, as it is called in Crowley's Thoth deck. But I will call this the universe, okay? And uh, this is what we're talking about here. Here you have the same uh, things that we saw in the uh, Wheel of Fortune card. The Archangels. Uh, it, it's a... It's a reflection of the zero card of the soul, okay? Because it's the big zero card, the huge universe, the macrocosm that reflects the microcosm of the zero that we saw in the soul card. So the wreath that shows the, you know, high point and low point, you know, namely the, you know, solstices, the high point of light, low point of light, etc., you know, depicted by the, the ribbons, the infinity signs at the top and bottom of the wreath, you know, that forms a huge zero, that wreath, because this is the huge cosmic egg of the cosmos itself and Mother Nature that rules it with both wands of the microcosm and macrocosm in her hands, you know, because she's wielding both of those wands. You know, we can wield the scepter of power of the self, but only nature commands both scepters, which is the the command of the microcosm and macrocosmic worlds. So this is nature, nature, spirit, God, whatever you want to call it, depicted here in the feminine aspect, surrounded by the principalities of the archangelic forces. Michael, Mikael, Gabriel, Raphael, Uriel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the lion, the man, the bull, the eagle, Leo, Aquarius, Taurus, Scorpio, the fixed signs of the zodiacal wheel. It's all there. You know, showing you that we are going to be getting into talking about universal forces now. Okay? So that's at the dot or occult knowledge position. What are we getting into learning now? Occult knowledge of natural world forces, of universal forces, not just the forces of the self or the aspects of the self. So let's move forward. Sorry about that. And we come to the Malkuth position or the base chakra. Okay, this is the judgment card. What happens when we stay in ignorance? Okay, so what we have to understand here is that this whole tree is a correspondence to the first tree that we saw. So what was the wheel of fortune at the Malkuth position? It represented individual ignorance, meaning you're not making any progression of your soul at an individuated level. Well, what is this card showing us at the macrocosmic level or at a societal level, at a, at a level of a whole uh, species of beings calling themselves human beings? If we, we are being called by these higher level forces of creation represented by the angel blowing the trumpet, wielding the, the cross, of St. George in this image, okay? Representing being called out of our ignorance, the graves. The graves represent the ignorance of the soul, keeping the soul encased or entombed in darkness. And we are being called up out of that level of spiritual deadness through the waters of renewal, baptism. We're not talking about, you know, that in a religious sense, folks, in the Christian sense of, of the exoteric religion, we're talking about being baptized into the waters of knowledge of self and universal law. And we're being called out of that ignorance 
by this force. What's above that force, right? If you look above it on the side, the left-hand side, it's the sun. That's the truth itself. You know, that's the truth of the creator. And who's ushering it toward us is the Christ consciousness, the child of innocence. You know, holding that red flag again, representing that rubedo element of alchemy. The purification of the philosopher's stone. Okay, so the judgment card is saying if we stay in ignorance, this is the result. Judgment. And I would not change the word. Okay, I'll call this judgment. Okay, this is societal judgment. This is world judgment. This is the judgment of a whole planet in, depicted in this card. When we stay in individuated ignorance, our entire society stays in a place of judgment. Okay? So, this is the result that we get when we reject truth. There is a card that represents the embracing of truth leading up to a higher level, and then there is a card that leads to the rejection of truth, leading to a lower level of consciousness. Okay, so this is the end result where a society ends up if we reject truth in judgment. Universal judgment. We're talking about the judgment of natural law, not of a, you know, anthropomorphized deity. We're talking about the judgment that we're already in as a result of rejecting the Son. You know, not the idea of Jesus as God's Son, but the idea of knowledge that could be converted to become Christ consciousness as the biblical allegorical figure of Jesus requests us to do, to receive freedom, to know the truth, and the truth will set us free. All of these allegories are contained within the tarot. Of course they are. So this is the sun. This is the light of God, the light of the creator. True knowledge, truth that we can either accept or reject. And that is the savior of the world, ladies and gentlemen. You could put this into the Christian allegory all day long, all you want. But even in that allegory, Jesus is telling you he's the truth and the light. You know, the sun is the truth and the light. You know, and it's always been symbolically depicted as our actual star, the sun, which gives life to all the beings of this planet and the whole solar system. The whole life in the solar system would not continue without the actual star, our sun, soul. The, it's called the soul. Just think about it. You know, it's amazing. This child is the Christ consciousness riding the white horse, which can be life or death. You know, depending on whether we accept or reject truth or not. Again, the red flag, the symbol of alchemical rubedo, the creation of the philosopher's stone, the refinement of the stone. Brilliant symbolism, just, you know, pun intended, brilliant. And again, um, I'm sorry, let's just, I won't go back, but just take it back to the double 10 or 20 is the 10 card. And then 10 and 9, the 19 card, is the 9 position. So all you have to do is lop off the first 10 in this whole series to get the arrangement. Because the 21 card is um, the world. Okay? And 21 is 777. Seven, seven. Complete, completion in the human domain. The number 777. Seven, seven. Okay? So absolutely spectacular correspondence is there. So let's go up to the moon. Now we are at the base of the feminine pillar or the pillar of severity. Now in this aspect, on this tree, the macrocosmic tree, the left-hand path is negative and the right-hand path is positive. So this is actually the negative pole and the positive pole of duality. We can look at these as not just you know, you, they can still be viewed as masculine and feminine, but the allegory doesn't hold as well as positive and negative, with the right-hand path being the positive outcome and the left-hand path being the negative outcome, okay? And you'll see what I mean as we go through this. So the moon card is the rejection of truth card. That's what I would call it 
uh, and I would call the sun card, not, not to step back, I would call it truth. That will be the card called truth in my deck, simply. This card, the moon, will be called rejection of truth. And that is most certainly where the people of the earth are at. This is what we chose. We chose the left-hand path, folks. Sad to say. Horrified to say. But this is where we're at as a society. So you have the dog, the wolf, you know, the, the, the lobster, you know, representing forces that are, do not have the kind of free will that we have because their free will choice is in a place of darkness represented by the rejection of truth, the moon going into the animalistic where there is not as much free will choice to be had. And the animal kingdom is largely at the, the, the disposal of higher level natural forces. It's far more than we are at. We are actually in a position of being able to, through our behavioral choices, control what happens as a result in our experience to a large extent. And so these lower level forces are depictions of ignorance symbolically in this card. It's depictions of having made the wrong choice and gone down the wrong path that's going to lead to a much differ, uh, much more difficult path in life. Now, as we go to the next position on the tree of life, this is the base of the masculine pillar or the active pillar, or in this case, the positive pillar. The star represents the acceptance of truth and the beginning of alchemical work on a societal level. So this is coming into harmony with the natural forces, not rejecting them. So this I would call acceptance of truth in my deck. And it means that we are taking the light in through the, the lesser lights of the heavens, the stars, which we are comprised of that star matter. And so we are opening up to the flow of proper reception. Okay. Hence it has this feminine symbolism on it of having one foot in the waters of spirituality and having one foot in the, on, upon the ground of the earth. Again, this is part of boots on the ground spirituality. As I call it streetwise spirituality, it's doing the work, the spiritual work represented by the alchemical waters on the ground, bringing that water onto the ground of the earth. Okay. But you, in order to do that, you have to accept the truth first, because that's what that water is. If you're going to gather it up in those, in those pails, you know, you want to just really look at it in those, in those jugs, it's coming up into the jug of her right hand and she's pouring it out into the jug of her left hand. She's not pouring the one, she's gathering it from that one. It's coming up from the universal force, the universal waters into her jug in the, in the right hand where her foot is at in the water. And then she's pouring it out onto the earth with her left hand. Okay. So absolutely, again, incredible correspondent symbolism here regarding what we need to do to accept truth and then spread truth in the world. Okay. And all of that's an act of will, right? We were just on the rung that represented the will. You know, the star itself is on that, that um, sacrum chakra. Again, that knowledge, sacrum, sacred, generative. We have to arrive through it through will and care, willpower and care to take it in. So you could look at that. This force is the, the heart true care to take in the truth. It's like the chalice upside down, taking the truth into it. Okay. We could either take the truth in or we could reject it. It's an act of will and care. And again, what this card here represents is the heart chakra. It's at the heart chakra position, which is unitary. It's not a dual chakra. Okay. On the tree of life correspondence system. But what it represents, what the tower card represents, and what I would call it on my deck is change. Change is universal certainty. Nothing stays stagnant. Stagnation in the universe is death and non-existence. 
And it doesn't real like you could say, yes, there's the death card and that's the stagnation card and or the involution card as a force in nature. But really, it's still change. It's something progressing to become something else. The same with evolution. And that process goes on and on, whether it's a, an ascension or a declination. But it can never be stopped. No matter what you want to call those forces or how you, you're, you're progressing within that cyclical nature of those forces, change is always occurring and can never stop occurring. That's why it's called the one change. The universe is the one change. Hence, this is the center. The change card is the center of it. It's the central focus of the whole thing. Versari in Latin means change. Una in Latin means one. One change. Once again, it's right there. Everything is change. Everything is one form of energy flowing to another. One form of consciousness flowing to another. And can never be any other way. So this is the change card. What do we see? The thunderstruck tower. That's a whole representation of the tree of life itself. The lightning striking the whole tree or tower. And the masculine and feminine forces, you know, being thrown from it. And the yod, you know, the fire, the yods representing the fire. Change is a fiery powerful force, electrical force, lightning, it's, it's tumultuous. So this is the thunderstruck tower in many decks. And I would simply call it the change card. Okay. Now that change could be positive or negative, depending on whether we have accepted truth or rejected truth. So what happens when we reject truth? We go into slavery. So this is the devil card depicted as the traditional sim symbolism of Satanism from the, you know, older Christian tradition as the, you know, the goat, you know, the goat of Mendez, etc. with the inverted pentagram. The number is 15, which when reduced is six, which is the failure of higher level consciousness and we see the man and the woman or depiction of Adam and Eve uh, with chains around their neck in a state of slavery to the devil or Shatan, the adversary, the opposer, the force of involution has taken us and is holding us captive. This is called slavery. In my deck, this will be the slavery card because what happens on this tree of life pillar? You know, the bottom of the pillar is rejection of truth. Well, what happens in the world externally? That's the internal aspect societally. The moon is the rejection of truth. As we go up that pillar of severity or that left-hand path, we arrive at slavery. And we arrive at slavery by rejecting truth. So this is the slavery card. And you'll notice that the chains are not tight around the neck of the enslaved man and woman. They could be taken off at any time by an act of their will, meaning this is not a determinate force. It's all based on free will choice of how we will behave. Will we learn the forces of the self in the universe? And will we behave according to natural law? And well, if we do, those chains could be easily slipped out of. It's not something that is set in stone. But if we accept negative influence and reject truth, those chains will remain exactly there around our necks like a noose. And we're not going anywhere as far as progress as a society or in consciousness at all, universally. See, that's what this is about. This shows you what's our progress, both personally, are we moving toward self-mastery individually, and are we moving toward a free society under natural law as a species? This is what the tower was an indicator of. All we need to do is look at the symbolism and read the book and we can understand where we're at. Let me tell you something, folks. This is the card that represents where we're at. Put that card up full screen. This is it. That's it right there. That's where humanity's at. Slavery. And we're getting ready to head upward a, a rung on the left-hand path, folks. That's where we're a-going. 
if things don't change. Oh, they're always changing. But I mean, if they don't change in the better direction. And guess what? The universe will give us exactly what we give it. And it's working perfectly. That's why I'm not angry about that. I, I'm saying that. I'm angry about the choice that's being made willfully to reject truth. That's what I'm upset about because it doesn't have to be this way. That card is a choice. Put, put it up full screen again, please. That, that card, slavery, is a choice. It's not a determined factor. It's a free will choice. And people better start understanding that free will is very real. It's in our hands. And all it comes down to is do we accept truth or do we reject it? And all you have to do to chart the progress of society is look at where we're at. Are we in freedom or are we in slavery? And then you'll know tarot is exactly telling us the true indicator of where we're at as an entire society. Let's move to the next card, which is temperance. I would call this the freedom card. This would be true freedom. You could call this sovereignty as well. This is the sovereignty card of the deck but I'll just call it probably freedom in my deck. Okay. This is what happens. Once again, you see that idea of one foot in the waters, one foot on the earth being grounded, not floating out in some woo woo version of spirituality, but being firmly grounded upon the earth with one foot in the waters of the spiritual nature. Okay. The waters flowing between the two cups, the two chalices. The crown chakra being arrived at representing self mastery. Okay. The crown on the angel's head, the, the fire of will, you know, you have all the elements there, earth, air, water, and fire, all unified, all required for true freedom. The illuminate, the sovereign being the angel, incredible symbolism. They call it temperance, you know, whereas they call the other one, the devil. I call them slavery and freedom. This is the freedom card, the devil's slavery. This is what happens to a whole society when it accepts truth and works upon itself to embrace all sentient beings sovereignty. That's the only way we'll ever arrive at true freedom. It cannot be done any other way by universal law. Passing through the realm of that, of universal knowledge, of knowledge of natural law. Now we get to the two highest forces on the respective pillars. Okay, and again, the freedom card is on the external or masculine pillar. Because that's what happens to a society. It's the positive pillar. That's what happens to a society when it accepts truth. That active principle, acceptance. Okay? When we reject it, the passive aspect on the feminine pillar, the path of severity, we go beyond slavery into extinction or death. This is the involution card. We're almost out of time, folks. I'll press it to the very end, but we'll continue this at the beginning of next week's show. So this is the involution card. We talked about the forces of involution versus evolution on the shows about Satanism. That's what led to this entire show. Talking about the position of the death card as the involution card at the top, top of the macrocosmic tree of life in the bina position or at the top of the feminine pillar. What happens when we reject truth? We go into slavery and eventually into extinction and involution takes over and we have to start all over again. And then we end up at judgment, the bottom of the tree of life, universal judgment. That's all the time we have for this edition of what on earth is happening, ladies and gentlemen. We'll get to those last two cards next week and we'll continue with this breakdown of the universal, uh, the aspects of the tarot deck from a position of revelation of where we are as individuals and where our entire society is as a whole. Thank you for watching and remember government is slavery. We'll see you right here next week. Thanks everyone. Oh, do me a favor too. check out gifts.waterandearthishappening.com. Lots of new items going up there this week. And also, uh, check out the ARC section because a lot of people have been taking me up on the ARC offer and they've been going out worldwide. I want that trend to continue. So go to the ARC, request the ARC, and really 
get a lot more knowledge that isn't even here on What on Earth is Happening that I've been collecting for the last 20 years. That's all the time we have. Government is slavery. We'll see you right here next week.